Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. The following is a portion of an article that appeared in the New York Times on August 12, 1979, referring to an atomic bomb test carried out back in 1953 and is based on reporting by Wendell Rawls Jr. and A.O. Sulzberger Jr. and was written by Mr. Sulzberger. Washington, the atomic bomb was detonated at exactly 4.30 a.m., April 25, 1953 just as the 300-foot steel skeletal tower it topped was becoming visible in the pre-dawn darkness. It was a big blast, almost twice as powerful as any previously tested on American shores, and the shock waves that spread from the barren, lonely Yucca Flat side of the Nevada atomic testing grounds that chilly morning carried more than fallout. That shot, codenamed Simon, carried more trouble than any other in a series of 11 atomic bomb tests 26 years ago according to newly declassified civilian and military documents, as well as interviews with some of the personnel involved. It dusted the nearby mesas and rangeland with enough radiation to force the government to throw up roadblocks and decontamination centers in a hasty, unplanned effort to minimize the damage. There was more to the story, but nowhere in the entire article or in the declassified documents was the story of a clandestine experiment carried out by a small group of individuals looking to enrich themselves and one U.S. Army soldier who was present for that blast. Michael Bliss never knew his father, and his mother died when he was 15. So for the last three years, Michael lived with his grandmother in Cincinnati, Ohio. Michael was a handsome young man with an athletic build, and at 6 feet 5 inches tall, he stood out in any crowd. In high school, Michael's good looks and friendly nature made him many friends, as well as many female admirers. After graduating from high school, Michael felt a little lost. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He only knew that he wanted to get away from Cincinnati for a while. On October 14, 1945, three days after his 18th birthday, Michael Bliss enlisted in the U.S. Army. Because of his size, when Michael finished basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, he received orders to go to Fort McClellan, Alabama, for military police training. Michael spent four and a half months at Fort McClellan, and on March 14, 1946, he completed his military police training and was assigned to the Provost Marshal's office at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Over the next seven years, Michael served at three different bases and had reached the rank of Staff Sergeant before being assigned to Camp Desert Rock in Mercury Valley, Nevada, in February 1953. On January 3, 1953, five men were attending a secret meeting in the basement of a soon-to-be-retired Army officer's barracks near Las Vegas, Nevada. In attendance at the meeting were Brigadier General Horace Martin, Vice Commander of Atomic Weapons Research, Dr. Robert Baker, a major in the Army and the lead medical officer in charge of the atomic weapons test site, Matthew Collins, Assistant Director of the CIA, responsible for gathering intelligence on Soviet weapons, Dr. Werner Schmidt, a former Nazi scientist brought over from Germany after the war to do medical research on the effects of atomic fallout on health. The last member of the group was Dr. Jonas Bradshaw, a biochemist for a large pharmaceutical company. Dr. Bradshaw was researching possible treatments for radiation poisoning, and his company was supplying the financial backing for their project. Assistant Director Collins called the meeting to discuss their secret project, codenamed REORP, an acronym for Reduce Effects of Radiation Poisoning. REORP was created by Dr. Baker, Dr. Schmidt, and Dr. Bradshaw. The three men were trying to develop a cure for radiation poisoning. They believed that combinations of specific chemicals introduced into a body shortly after radiation exposure could reverse the effects of radiation poisoning. The three men followed different tracks and came up with three solutions, believing that at least one would work. Major Baker was certain that the Pentagon would not allow them to do human testing of their solutions but he felt it was necessary to push ahead anyway. Major Baker knew he would need help to pull this off, so he contacted his friend, A.D. Collins, and told him about their secret project. Major Baker convinced A.D. Collins that not only could their project save lives, but it would also be very lucrative for those involved. A.D. Collins brought General Martin into the project because they would need someone inside the Pentagon to help carry out their plan. Assistant Director Collins ran the meeting. Where do we stand with the development of the chemical solutions? Collins asked. We've got three solutions, K-47, H-42, and N-68. Why zero O you will find these chemical compounds described in the documents in front of you? All three showed promise when tested on lab rats, 
and we believe that at least one of them will work and possibly all three, Major Baker said. We have color-coded the three solutions for easy identification. Solution K, 47 is red, H, 42 is blue, and N, 68 is green. We are ready for the A-bomb test on April 25th. General, have you identified your test subjects yet? Collins asked. I got their files right here, General Martin replied. Private First Class Douglas Tally. Height 6 feet. Weight 185 pounds. PFC Tally has no living family and currently has no girlfriend. Tally passed the physical training test we arranged last month. Private Andrew Steinhauer, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 175. PVT Steinhauer has no living family and no girlfriend. PVT Steinhauer passed his PT test. Private First Class William Locke, height 6 feet 1 inch, weight 182. PFC Locke has no family, no girlfriend. PFC Locke passed his PT test. Staff Sergeant Michael Bliss, height 6 feet 5 inches, weight 210. Sergeant Bliss has no family, no girlfriend. SFC Bliss passed his PT test. Since we only have only three solutions to test, why do we have four subjects, and why use a staff sergeant as one of the subjects? Collins asked. Three of the test subjects will each be treated with one of the solutions. One will get red, one blue, and one green. The fourth subject will not be treated and will act as a control. We chose Sergeant Bliss, so there will be someone in authority to make sure the other three do what we want them to do, Major Baker said. What happens to the one subject that doesn't get treated? He will probably die after several weeks, Major Baker said. How do you plan to cover that up? He will have an accident in the desert and his vehicle will catch fire. That's pretty cold-blooded, isn't it? A.D. Collins asked. Can't be helped. We have to have a control subject. How will this work? Collins asked. We will have a tent set up in area two and a quarter miles from the test site. We have determined that the fallout in that particular spot will be high enough to expose soldiers to the right amount of radiation for the purposes of our test. The tent will contain everything we need to treat the three subjects with the red, blue, and green solutions. Two hours before the A-bomb test, our four subjects will drive out to the tent in a truck with a generator and some electronic equipment labeled scientific equipment on board. Sergeant Bliss will have orders to start the generator and turn on the electronic equipment one hour before detonation. Once the equipment is running, the four men are to stand guard until relieved. The fallout from the bomb test will produce enough radiation to cause a mild case of radiation poisoning that we will treat immediately after the exposure. What scientific equipment will be on the truck? General Martin said, just an old oscilloscope and a power supply to make the scope display a wavy line so that it will look like the equipment is doing something, Major Baker said. I hope you all realize that if this turns to shit, all of our bums will be on the line. So what happens if any of these men die? That's why VE picked men a mighty no familian, Dr. Schmidt said. We haben Kontingenzies. A.D. Collins didn't like the idea of having a former Nazi on the team but he knew that Dr. Schmidt was a brilliant scientist, so they were stuck with him. A.D. Collins looked around the room and said, I guess we are ready. We will have no more meetings before the April test. Just don't screw this up. April 25, 1953. Early that Saturday morning, 25-year-old Sergeant Michael Bliss, along with PVT Steinhauer, PFC Lock, and PFC Tally, loaded a generator and two pieces of electronic equipment onto a two-and-a-half-ton truck and headed out into the desert. Their destination was a supply tent set up about two-and-a-quarter miles from the atomic test site in Yucca Flat. Their orders were to park next to the supply tent, then, at 3.30, start the generator and turn on the electronic equipment. With the equipment running, they were to stand guard around the truck and the supply tent and wait for the detonation at 4.30. This morning's detonation would be the second bomb test the four soldiers would experience. On March 17th, the four of them sat in a trench two miles from the blast with 1,000 other soldiers for an A-bomb test. This time they would be above ground during the test. Only three people at the test site and a couple more back in Washington knew that Sergeant Bliss and his men were placed intentionally in a position where they would be exposed to a small amount of fallout from the bomb. They wanted to expose their subjects to enough radiation to cause a mild case of radiation poisoning. Then they would treat three of the soldiers with the chemical solutions they developed. 
PVT Steinhauer would not receive any of the treatments so that they could compare his progress with that of the other three. They hoped that they could find a cure for mild cases of radiation poisoning. If their plan worked, they would rerun the test against higher doses of radiation. If they were successful again, they would patent their treatment and make a great deal of money for the pharmaceutical company providing financial support for their test and enrich themselves in the process. As instructed, Sergeant Bliss fired up the generator and turned on the two electronic boxes. By four o'clock, everything was working. He didn't know what the electronic boxes were supposed to do, but they appeared to be working the way he was told they should. At 425, Sergeant Bliss told his men to go inside the tent until after the detonation. When the men entered the supply tent, they were surprised to find four cots along one side of the tent, and on the other side were shelves with medical supplies. There were three large glass flasks on one of the shelves, the type you would see in a science lab, each filled with a different color liquid and sealed with a glass stopper. The liquids in the flasks were red, blue, and green. On a table near the shelves, there were three large syringes with long hypodermic needles. Sergeant Bliss thought the tent looked more like a small emergency mobile medical center than a supply tent. After studying the contents of the tent, Sergeant Bliss closed the flaps and checked his watch. It's 427. It is three minutes to zero hour. Turn away from the blast and close your eyes until I tell you to open your eyes, Sergeant Bliss told his men. Just after 429, a gust of wind blew the tent flaps open, and before Sergeant Bliss could pull the flaps back in place, there was a flash of light so bright that it disoriented the four men, followed by the ear-splitting sound of the explosion. In seconds, they felt the heat from the blast. The shock wave from the blast threw PFC lock against the shelves causing the flasks with the red, blue, and green liquids to fall. All three flasks broke and spilled their contents on the floor. The liquids mixing on the floor caused a chemical reaction, which produced a dense cloud of yellow gas inside the tent. Sergeant Bliss told his men to get out of the tent, and in his haste to escape the fumes, Sergeant Bliss slipped and fell in the slimy mixture of chemicals and broken glass. Major Baker and his team were unaware that there had been a shift in wind direction, increasing the amount of fallout in the area of the truck and the supply tent. When the three doctors, wearing protective gear, checked on their test subjects, they found PFC lock, PCF tally, and PVT Steinhauer lying on the ground outside the tent gasping for air. When asked where Sergeant Bliss was, PCF Tally pointed to the tent. They found Sergeant Bliss lying in the middle of a gas emitting puddle of chemicals and broken glass. In a panic, Major Baker told Tally, Locke, and Steinhauer to get Sergeant Bliss and get on the truck. Major Baker drove the truck while Drs. Bradshaw and Schmidt followed in their Jeep. Two weeks later, Major Baker, Dr. Schmidt, and Dr. Bradshaw were huddled outside a room in a deserted wing of the base hospital discussing the terrible situation in which they found themselves. Reorp had no authorization by the Pentagon to perform their test, and it had become a complete disaster. Tally, Locke, and Steinhauer had already died from radiation poisoning, and their bodies were on ice in the hospital morgue, while Sergeant Bliss lay in the room behind them in a coma. Like the others, Sergeant Bliss was exposed to lethal radiation levels but he was also exposed to the mixture of chemicals on the tent floor and the gas they produced. Dr. Schmidt had spent two hours removing broken glass from the sergeant's back when they first brought him into the hospital. If anyone found out that those four men had intentionally been exposed to a fatal dose of radiation, there would be hell to pay. I don't understand how he could still be alive, said Major Robert Baker. The exposure to that much radiation should have been enough to kill him like it did the others and the sergeant was exposed to the mixture of our chemicals and the gases they emitted. Dr. Schmidt, the German scientist, said, No Vaughn can know that we have done. Then he dies, V must make the sergeants disappear MIT to others. Dr. Schmidt is right. If anyone comes asking why we are hiding a dying man back here, we're sunk. We will have to dispose of his body along with the others before anyone finds him here, Dr. Bradshaw said. I think V.E. should make sure that the sergeant is not discovered, said Dr. Schmidt. I think V.E. should speed things along. No, no, we can't be thinking like that. In this country, we don't do things the way you did in your country during the war. We will not add to our crime by speeding up his death. We have to find another way, Major Baker said. He will probably be gone in a couple of days anyway, so we will wait. 
We will decide what to do then. Unknown to the three men, Sergeant Bliss had wakened and heard their conversation. They said he should be near death from exposure to the radiation and the chemicals, but he didn't feel sick or even injured. Sergeant Bliss heard as much as he could stand and rushed into the hallway to confront the doctors. I ain't dying, and you a-holes ain't gonna kill me. So how you gonna make it worth it for me to keep my mouth shut? Sergeant Bliss yelled at the doctors. The three men just stared at Sergeant Bliss in disbelief. Major Baker arranged to have Sergeant Bliss move to a more comfortable room, with a sign on the door saying quarantine, authorized personnel only. For the next three weeks, the three doctors, one general at the Pentagon, an assistant director at CIA, and their financial backers worked to find a plan that would protect them and keep Sergeant Bliss happy and quiet. When they finally arrived at the solution they believed would work, the conspirators negotiated with Sergeant Bliss. It took them three days to hammer out a proposal that Sergeant Bliss agreed to sign. The main points of the agreement were that Sergeant Bliss would have to disappear. His name would be changed, and he would be moved to someplace where no one knew him. He had to agree never to tell anyone what happened at Yucca Flat, and also, Sergeant Bliss had to agree to meet with the doctors once every six months for a complete medical checkup. For his cooperation, an annuity would be set up for Sergeant Bliss that would pay him $3,000 each month for as long as he lived for agreeing to their conditions. The money would come from the pharmaceutical company and the CIA. Sergeant Bliss was happy to sign the agreement. $36,000 a year was a lot of money for someone his age. He saw himself living the good life for many years. On the other hand, the doctors and their backers never expected him to live more than three or four years. They anticipated that Sergeant Bliss would develop one or more cancers that would eventually cause his demise. They were just happy that they could continue to study the changes in the sergeant health until the end of his life. A week after Michael signed the agreement, General Martin and Major Baker came to see Michael. Sergeant, we have had a bit of luck. A wounded soldier sent back from Korea passed away yesterday. He was a close match for your description. So we have swapped your identities, General Martin said. So, First Lieutenant Jackson Winslow will become Sergeant Michael Bliss, and you will become Lieutenant Jackson Winslow. So, I'll still be in the Army but now as an officer? Michael said. No, you will receive a medical discharge with a disability. You will have a military ID that will allow access to any VA hospital, if needed. The following week when Dr. Baker came to get Michael, the doctor found him looking at himself in a mirror and saying over and over, Hi, I'm Jackson Winslow. Before he said anything to Michael, Dr. Baker handed Michael an accident report from the provost's office at Camp Desert Rock. The statement read, On the morning of May 12, 1953. A truck carrying four soldiers went off the road and down an embankment and caught fire. The four occupants perished in the fire. The report went on to list the four dead soldiers. The first name on the list was Sergeant Michael Bliss. The next three names were Locke, Tally, and Steinhauer. Neither Dr. Baker nor Michael commented on the report. Dr. Baker handed Michael a large envelope and said, Here are your medical disability and discharge papers. It's time to go, Sergeant. Shouldn't you be calling me Lieutenant Winslow now? Dr. Baker looked at Michael like he was some kind of bug under his microscope. With me, you will always be addressed as sergeant. So, where is my new home going to be? Michael asked. June 1953. Jackson Winslow arrived in Brodericksburg, Pennsylvania, in June 1953 and rented a house on the corner of Quaker Street and William Penn Road. After settling into his new home, he went to the First Bank of Brodericksburg and opened checking and savings accounts and began depositing half of each annuity check into the savings account and the rest in his checking account. Michael was determined not to waste money because he didn't trust the people he made his deal with. At 6 feet 5 inches tall and 210 pounds, the 25-year-old was hard to miss as he moved about town. He seemed a likable sort and quickly made several friends around town. Jackson liked Brodericksburg but found that he didn't enjoy living in an apartment and decided that he would like to have a house with some land. Jackson started looking for real estate for sale on the outskirts of Brodericksburg. After two weeks of looking at real estate ads, he found a property that interested him. The listing was for a 13-room farmhouse with 25 acres of land and a barn. The ad referred to the farm as the Old Cobain Place. The ad also said that the house was empty and priced for a quick sale. 
Jackson contacted the real estate agent that listed the property and asked to see the place that afternoon. As they toured the property, the agent told Jackson that the house was over 100 years old and had been in the Cobain family for all of that time. The last members of the Cobain family moved away in 1947, leaving the house unoccupied. Two weeks earlier, the agent got the family's go-ahead to sell the farm. The house was structurally sound but needed a lot of work to take care of all of the required repairs. The work didn't put Jackson off, as he had nothing else to do with his time. He was interested in the place, and the price of $12,000 meant he could afford it. He told the agent that he was interested in the farm, but he wanted to think about it overnight. When he got back to town, Jackson went to the library and asked the librarian if she could help him. When the librarian looked up, Jackson was stunned by her beauty. She was a blue-eyed blonde, and she took his breath away. The librarian smiled at him and said, I'm Margot Kurtz, and you're Jackson Winslow, aren't you? Jackson stammered a little as he asked, How do you know me? Everyone in town knows who you are, or at least all of the girls do, Margot said. Jackson could feel his face flush, and tried to cover it up by asking Margot if she knew any possible resource that would give him historical information about the old Cobain place. When Margot stood up to assist him, he got his second shock. Margot was not only beautiful, but she was also very tall, at least six feet tall. Margot told Jackson to follow her and led him to the library's reference room, where she pointed to several volumes listed as histories of Brodericksburg. You should be able to find what you need here, Margot said. If you need any assistance, please let me know. She gave Jackson a big smile as she left the room. Jackson spent three hours digging through the books before he found what he wanted. He had discovered an article written for the Brodericksburg Times in 1925. The article told the story of the old Cobain farm. The Brodericksburg Times, March 16, 1925. In 1847, Quimby Cobain built a farmhouse on 25 acres of land adjacent to Wismer Road, one mile south of Brodericksburg. The bricks for the large 13 room house were made from clay dug on his property and fired in a kiln built by Quimby. The farmhouse sits on a hill overlooking a large farm pond to the north and Wismer Road to the west. Besides the house, there is a dairy barn on the east side of the house. The barn cellar has stanchions for 15 milk cows, while on the main floor, there are stalls for plow and carriage horses. The third level of the barn is a loft for storing hay and grain to feed the animals. The only access to the farm is via a dirt lane, which runs 200 yards from Wismer Road up to the house. It is believed that the reason for the location of the farm was Cobain's need for privacy. Many people in Brodericksburg knew that Quimby Cobain was an abolitionist and that the Cobain farm was part of the Underground Railroad, helping runaway slaves escape into New York and then onto Canada. It is believed that as many as 800 men, women, and children took refuge on his farm during their long trek north. On October 1857, for officials from Virginia, really just bounty hunters, came to Brodericksburg looking for a group of runaway slaves they had been tracking. The men carried a letter from Henry Wise, the governor of Virginia, requesting local law enforcement's assistance in searching for the runaways. They received no help from the Brodericksburg police, so the four bounty hunters went out on their own and began visiting local farms looking for the freedom seekers. The last time the four men were seen was on Saturday, October 31st. The rumors around town were that the bounty hunters were not seen after going to the Cobain farm, but when the local authorities investigated, they found no sign of the missing men. Rumors started that Quimby Cobain killed the four men and buried them somewhere on the farm. Although the family denied the story, rumors persisted, and later someone claimed that the dead bounty hunters haunted the house. After Quimby died in 1878, his three sons took over the farm and lived there with their families. After reading the article, Jackson became obsessed with owning the Cobain farm. As he was leaving the library, Margot came out from behind her desk and asked him if he found the information he needed. Yes, I did, thank you. You were very helpful. Margot flashed her smile again and said, I'm glad I could help. I hope we see you again. Jackson smiled at Margot and said, I intend to make a point of seeing you again. This time it was Margot that blushed. The next morning Jackson called the real estate agent and offered $10,500 for the farm. He had to wait three days to get the answer he wanted and on August 15th, Jackson took ownership of the old Cobain farm. That night, Jackson dropped into a local bar he frequented to have a beer. 
As he stood talking to the bartender, he felt a hand on his arm, and when he turned to see who it was, he found Margot standing next to him. I didn't expect to see you again so soon, Margot said. I am certainly glad to see you again, Jackson said. Can I ask why you were interested in the history of the old Cobain place? I was thinking of buying the farm and wanted to know its story. So did you buy it? Yes, as of today, it belongs to me. Really? Kids at school used to say that the house is haunted. You don't believe that, do you? No, I don't believe in ghosts, Margot said. That's good because I wouldn't want my new girlfriend to be afraid of ghosts. New girlfriend? Huh? Aren't you getting a little ahead of yourself? I haven't even agreed to go out with you yet. Well then, would you have dinner with me tomorrow night? Can I think about that for a while? Sure, you can have two minutes. Margot looked at her watch and then tilted her head back and looked up at the ceiling. When she looked back at Jackson, she said, Okay, yes, I'll have dinner with you if we can go dancing after. Their dinner was excellent, but for Margot, it was the dancing that she enjoyed the most. Being six feet tall made her taller than any other guy she had dated, and with Jackson, she could wear heels and still not be taller than he was. While they were dancing, Margot asked him what he did for a living. He didn't want to lie to her, so he stretched the truth a bit. I don't work. I was a lieutenant in the U.S. Army and was involved in a serious accident that has left me with some permanent injuries. I am on disability, so the government sends me a check every month so that I don't have to work. I am doing a lot better than the doctors thought I ever would, but I still have to go to the VA hospital in Philadelphia once every six months for a checkup. It was as close to the truth as he dared get. After that first date, Margot and Jackson went out together at least twice a week or more. Jackson was putting in long days, working on the repairs that the old farmhouse required when he received a call from Dr. Baker in October. The doctor called to remind Jackson that he was due for his six-month checkup. Dr. Baker directed him to report to the new REORP lab the three doctors had set up in Philadelphia the following day and planned to stay overnight. When Jackson arrived at the REORP lab, he passed through a large empty room and into a smaller room set up like a doctor's examination room. Dr. Baker, Dr. Bradshaw, and Dr. Schmidt were waiting for him there. While the doctors drew blood and took x-rays of his body, Jackson happily told the doctors about the farmhouse he was restoring and Margot, his new girlfriend. The doctor's reaction to his stories disappointed him. They showed no interest in his life the life he was forced to live because of their screw-up. His dislike of the doctors increased that day. After two days of being poked and prodded, and his physical stress levels tested along with the time required for him to return to his regular pulse and heart rate, Major Baker told Jackson he could leave. As he was making his way out of the lab, the three doctors discussed their findings. There is no change into Sergeant's Weidel's, Dr. Schmidt said. Die Temperatur 98.5 Blutpressor 12075 Pulse 50. Did you notice the scars from the broken glass on his back? They are almost entirely gone. I've never seen scars recede so quickly, Dr. Bradshaw said. I noticed that too. The sergeant looks healthier than he did before the accident, Dr. Baker said. Do you know what this means? The other two doctors smiled as they looked at Dr. Baker and waited for him to say more. The sergeant was inside the tent lying on broken glass and the spilled chemical solutions, while the other men were outside the tent. They were all exposed to the same amount of radiation, but only the sergeant survived. We may have accidentally created a miracle treatment for more than just radiation poisoning. We must try and recreate the mixture that the sergeant was exposed to and do another test. Yeah, we must try. Jackson's relationship with Margot was becoming more serious, and he was beginning to think about marriage. They were spending most of their free time together, and on weekends, Margot often came out to the farmhouse to help him with his current project. After nearly nine months, Jackson had finished the work in all of the rooms on the second floor and only had one room left on the main floor. It was a small room off of the kitchen that he decided to turn into an office. One wall of the room had built-in cabinets and drawers from floor to ceiling. The built-ins were in poor condition, and he deemed them not salvageable. Jackson was in the process of tearing out the built-ins when he discovered a bundle of papers rolled up and tied with a piece of string in the wall behind the cabinets. The documents turned out to be the original architectural design drawings for the Cobain house and barn. 
Jackson studied the drawings and noticed a feature that appeared to indicate an underground tunnel connecting the house and barn. There was no mention of a tunnel in the article that Jackson read about the Cobain farm, and the real estate agent didn't mention it. Jackson wondered if anyone other than Quimby Cobain knew of its existence and if it was still there. With the drawings in hand, Jackson went down to the cellar with a flashlight and closely examined the east wall in the area indicated on the architectural drawing. In the dark cellar, even with the flashlight, he could find nothing to indicate the existence of a door or any other opening in the stone foundation. He studied the drawings again and saw an arrow pointing up between the floor joists where they sat on top of the foundation. Written next to the arrow were the words, Latch Release. Jackson trained the flashlight between the floor joist above his head, and after a couple of minutes, he found it. The iron handle of the lever was almost below eye level behind the wall. Anyone shorter than him would not be able to see the handle. He pushed up on the lever until he heard a metallic clack and a portion of the stone wall moved. A section of the wall six feet wide and six feet tall had pivoted slightly, causing the left side to move into the basement a few inches while the right side retreated into the wall. Jackson pulled on the left side and turned the section of the wall till it opened to 90 degrees. He studied the tunnel entrance and found that it was built around an iron pole that acted as a single pivot point. With the entrance closed, it looked like the rest of the wall, and the stone joints fit so closely together that unless you knew exactly where the secret door was, you would never find it. If the farm was part of the Underground Railroad, Jackson guessed that Quimby Cobain used the tunnel to hide runaway slaves if anyone came looking for them. Jackson had to duck his head to get through the opening, but could stand once inside the tunnel. The tunnel air was cool and dry, but had the smell of a space that had been closed up for many years. He pointed the flashlight into the darkness, but he couldn't see more than a few feet ahead of him. He moved to his right until he touched the tunnel wall, and then started feeling forward along the wall while counting each step he took. He counted 215 steps before he reached the far end of the tunnel. Finding the door on this end of the tunnel was much easier. There was an iron bar, about six inches long, sticking out of the wall, and when Jackson pulled down on the bar, the door pivoted open, the same as the cellar entrance. He opened the door wider and found himself staring into the lower level of the barn. After examining the door from inside the barn, Jackson noticed no way to open the door from inside the barn. Even with both entrances to the tunnel opened, it was still too dark for Jackson to see into the deepest part of the tunnel. He headed back to the house to get a work light and two long extension cords to bring more light into the tunnel. When he re-entered the tunnel with his work light, he got a better look at the tunnel's dimensions. The tunnel was about 12 feet wide with an arched ceiling. The tunnel center was about 8.5 feet high and just under 7 feet high along the walls. As he explored the tunnel, he made a gruesome discovery. Halfway through the tunnel along the left wall were the desiccated remains of four men. The bodies were still in the clothes they were wearing when they died. Jackson noted that two of the bodies had obvious bullet holes in their skulls, and there appeared to be what looked like bullet holes in the coats the other two men were wearing. Based on their attire, he believed that the four bodies belonged to the missing bounty hunters. If he was right, the bodies had been in the tunnel for over 90 years. Jackson was amazed that there was anything left of them other than bones, but these bodies appeared mummified. Jackson was debating what he should do with his discovery when he heard a voice, no more than a whisper, say, help us. The hair on the back of his neck bristled, and he could feel the goose flesh on his arms and legs. He looked around the tunnel, but he was still alone. Jackson had almost decided that the voice was just in his imagination when he heard it again. Tell Governor Wise what happened to us. Jackson was scared and confused. From his research, he knew that Virginia Governor Henry Wise had given the four bounty hunters a letter of introduction, asking for local authorities in Pennsylvania to assist the bounty hunters in their hunt for the runaway slaves. Jackson wondered if he was really hearing the voices of the dead men in the tunnel, or if he was losing his mind. Are you speaking to me? Jackson asked, but got no response. Jackson closed the barnside entrance to the tunnel and left the tunnel at a dead run, closing the cellar's door behind him. He decided never to tell anyone about the tunnel or its contents and never go in there again. After that day, Jackson often felt a presence near him and would hear the whispers. He didn't know if all of the bounty hunters spoke to him or if it was just one of them. The voice always sounded the same. 
so Jackson decided it was only one of them. Over time, Jackson began to think of the voice only as the Virginian. He guessed that the spirit escaped from the tunnel while he had the doors opened. Deciding that the spirit or ghost or whatever it was didn't pose a threat to him, Jackson went back to work fixing up his house. With his study finished and the house in much better shape than it had been when he moved in, he thought the house would be a great place to raise a family. So, on March 6, 1954, Jackson Winslow proposed to Margot Kurtz, and she said yes. On Saturday, June 20, 1954, Jackson and Margot were married in a small ceremony attended by Margot's sister, Karen, and brother-in-law, Howard Bush. After the wedding, Jackson and Margot went back to the house to consummate their marriage. When Jackson met Margot, she was a virgin and insisted that she would remain one until she married. Their wedding night was going to be her first time. At home, Margot retreated to the bedroom to change, and Jackson got a bottle of champagne he bought that afternoon out of the refrigerator and poured a glass for each of them. When Margot reappeared, she was wearing a sexy pink nightgown. He felt himself becoming aroused as he offered Margot a glass of the champagne. Jackson made a toast to their love, then set the glasses aside and took her into his arms. He had never been as excited while kissing her as he was on their wedding night. Jackson had kissed her jugs, but this time was different because he knew that he was finally going to make love to Margot. They kissed and caressed each other while Jackson lifted Margot's nightgown over her head and dropped it on the floor. He picked her up and laid her on the bed. Jackson had never seen Margot in just her innerwear before, and he thought she was beautiful. He got undressed and joined Margot on the bed. While kissing her again, she wrapped her arms around him and held him so tight that he couldn't move for a couple of minutes. Are you okay? Jackson asked. I'm good now, Margot said. When Margot relaxed her grip, Jackson began sex with her. He kissed Margot on the lips and neck and then whispered, Does it feel good? Yes, it does. It feels fantastic, she said. Tell me how it feels and talk dirty. I love the way you're screwing me with your tool, she said. You are making my kitty so hot. I feel like I'm going to explode. Later, Margot told Jackson that she couldn't believe that she had said those things, but liked how it made her feel using those words to describe how she felt. They made love two more times that night before they went to sleep and did it again in the morning as soon as they woke up. After that, Margot couldn't get enough of Jackson. They were in love, hot for each other's bodies, and they made love almost every day for the next few months. Then, in October, Jackson got the call for his six-month checkup in Philadelphia. He told Margot that he would take the train down on Friday and stay overnight, returning home late Saturday night, and he asked her to pick him up at the depot. As Jackson was standing in the kitchen waiting for Margot to take him to the train station to head off to his appointment at the VA hospital, the Virginian spoke to him. You can't trust them. Without thinking, Jackson said out loud, you're right about that. Margot, who was coming into the kitchen, asked, are you talking to me? No, I was just thinking out loud, he said, then thought. I am going to have to be more careful about responding to the Virginian's comments when she's around. When Jackson returned home Tuesday night, Margot picked him up at the train station. When he got into the car, he noticed that Margot was sitting behind the wheel wearing just a warm coat and panties. Where are the rest of your clothes? I just thought that I would give you something to think about on the ride home. I am going to do more than think about it. I am going to get started right now. Jackson moved close to Margot and kissed her. I'll give you five minutes to stop that, or I will slap your hand, she said, as she returned Jackson's kiss. Just wait till I get you home. You're going to very busy slapping my hands, he said. Starting in 1956, Jackson began showing signs of paranoia. He believed that government agents were spying on him and meant to do him harm. He was losing interest in social life and began turning down Margot's request to go dancing. When they did go out, he didn't like the way other men looked at her. Things got to the point that Jackson didn't want to leave the house unless he had to. For a time, Margot stayed home with H.M., but she hated not having a social life. So she started going out with friends and ignored his pleas that she stay home. Nights when Jackson was home alone, which was happening more and more often, the Virginian would talk to him. And he found himself talking back, even though he knew the Virginian would not respond to anything he said. The Virginian's comments usually mirrored Jackson's fears and grievances. He wondered how the Virginian could understand him so well, but never responded to anything Jackson said to him. 
On October 26, 1959, Dr. Baker, who was now a colonel, called Jackson and told him to come to the Reorp lab on Friday the 30th and planned to stay until Sunday afternoon. Jackson told Margot about his upcoming trip, and it was apparent to him that something was off. She didn't seem to care that he would be away over Halloween weekend. In the past, Margot would make Jackson go out dancing with her on Halloween and then go home and make love. It surprised Jackson that she didn't seem to care that he would miss Halloween. Jackson arrived at the Reorp lab just after 2 o'clock on Friday. He was not looking forward to the medical examination he was about to receive. Jackson felt like a lab rat. The tests were always the same, and he hated all of them. He resented the treatment he received from the three doctors, and he hated that Nazi, Dr. Schmidt. Most of all, their attitude often made him want to bash their heads in, a desire that increased with each visit. Despite all of the tests performed on him, Jackson managed to hide his changing mental state. In their interviews with him, he never told the doctors about his fear that a secret government organization was watching his every move because he believed that the doctors could be a part of that organization. He also neglected to tell them about the Virginian who spoke to him when he was by himself. By 6 o'clock Saturday afternoon, Jackson had reached his limit with the tests and the doctor's attitudes. He addressed Colonel Baker and said, I have had as much of this shit as I can handle, so I am going home. Jackson waited for the colonel to try to stop him, but Baker said, That's fine. I believe we have what we need for now. We will see you in six months. After he left the lab, Colonel Baker wrote the following note in Jackson's file. No sign of radiation poisoning, no tumors or cancers, no blood diseases, and no changes in his overall physical condition. The most remarkable observance is the sergeant's appearance. The subject doesn't seem to have aged at all over the last five years. If anything, he appears to be healthier than he did before the event. Saturday, October 31, 1959. On the trip back from Philadelphia, he thought about the way Margot usually picked him up at the Broderick'sburg j, j rail station. He hoped that she would be there wearing something sexy. The sex was always unforgettable when he returned from one of his trips to the REORP lab. This time Jackson was disappointed to find that she wasn't at the station to pick him up, so he had to take a taxi home. He arrived home just after 11 p.m. The house was dark and the car was parked in the driveway. Jackson assumed that Margot had been out earlier, but where and with whom? He couldn't understand why she wasn't at the station waiting for him and why she didn't park the car in the barn when she got home. It angered him when she went off somewhere without him and without telling him. She was probably in bed already, so Jackson decided against talking to her until morning. Instead of going straight up to bed, Jackson went to the liqueur cabinet and got his bottle of VO and poured himself a double. He took the drink into his office and sat at his desk. As he took the first sip of the Canadian whiskey, he noticed an envelope with his name on it sitting on the desk. The envelope contained a note from Margot, along with her wedding and engagement rings. The message was brief and straight to the point. I can't stand living like this anymore. I don't have any friends because of you, and for the last two years, I have felt like a prisoner in this house. You are a cold man, and I don't love you. I have met someone, and he loves me and has asked me to go away with him. I have a right to be happy, so by the time you read this note, I will be gone, and I am never coming back. The note was signed Margot. After reading the note, he just sat at his desk, trying to control his building rage. He picked up his glass of VO and studied its amber color as he thought about what he should do. Should he go looking for Margot, or just let her go? He felt that if he could get his hands on her, he would make her regret cheating him. Jackson was just about to sip his drink when he heard a noise somewhere in the house. He sat quietly for a minute and listened for another sound. The house was quiet until he heard the whisper, She's here, it said. Jackson recognized the voice as the Virginian. After hearing the whispered alert, She's here, Jackson realized that the noise he heard came from the second floor of the house. Jackson opened one of the desk drawers and retrieved his army issue Colt .45, and then with gun in hand, he kicked off his shoes and quietly climbed the back staircase to the second floor and approached the bedroom. He stood outside the door for a moment and listened. The Virginian spoke again. You must punish her. Jackson pushed the bedroom door open looked inside. The room was dark and he could not see anything in the room. He stepped inside the room and turned on the overhead light. When he looked at the bed, 
he saw Margot and a man he didn't know, and both of them were naked. Jackson could see the fear in their eyes as they woke and saw him. Jackson could hear the fear in Margot's voice when she said, Jackson? So, you thought you were just going to walk out on me with him? He said, Please, just let us go, she said. Jackson heard the voice again, Kill them now. Jackson moved closer to Margot and said, You are never leaving me. The shot from the 45 almost took the top of Margot's head off. The noise from the gun's discharge left his ears ringing while Margot's lover pushed himself back against the headboard, then put his hands in front of him. The man began begging for his life, but it did no good. Jackson shot the man twice in the chest, then stared at the mayhem he had caused. Jackson had forgotten how loud a .45 could be in a confined space, but knew the house was far enough away from his neighbors that no one would have heard the gunshots, and to support that thought, the Virginian said, no one heard the shots when Quimby Cobain killed us. What do I do now? Jackson asked out loud as the gravity of what he had done sank in. What do I do now? Jackson broke down and started to cry until the Virginian spoke to him. You have to clean up the mess you made and hide the bodies. You know where to hide the bodies, don't you? You must bring them to us. Jackson looked around the bedroom to assess the damage and decide on a plan of action. The bodies of Margot and her lover would go into the tunnel, but what would he do with the blood-stained mattress, sheets, and pillowcases? He would have to find a way to dispose of them. Jackson went down to the cellar, opened the tunnel door, and set up his work light to see in the tunnel. He then went out to the barn to get a canvas tarp to cover the bodies so he could move them. When he entered the barn, he discovered a car parked where his car should have been. It was a 1956 Chevrolet station wagon. The car was another problem that Jackson would have to solve. The car would have to go before anyone came snooping around the farm. When he got back to the bedroom, he pulled the dead man's body off the bed and onto the trap, then rolled the body up in it. He dragged the body from the second floor down into the tunnel, dumped it from the tarp onto the ground, then pushed it against the wall near the remains of the four bounty hunters. On the way up to get Margot's body, he stopped in the office, picked up her rings, and put them in his pocket. Then, before wrapping Margot's body in a tarp, he slipped her rings on her finger. Holding Margot in his arms, Jackson said, Margot, why did you do this to us? I never wanted to hurt you. After sitting with her for a few minutes, he picked Margot up and carried her down to the tunnel. Jackson was much gentler with Margot's body, placing her on the floor and folding her hands together on her chest. Before he closed the tunnel, he wrapped the pistol in oilcloth and put it in the tunnel. In the bedroom, Jackson picked up the dead man's clothes off the floor and removed a wallet and car keys from the pants. He looked in the wallet and found that the man's name was Jerry Adler, and he had an address in Broderick'sburg. Jackson put the keys and the wallet in his pocket, then collected all of the bloody bed linens and stuffed them into one of the pillowcases in Adler's clothes. Next, he dragged the bloody mattress and the pillowcase filled with the stained bed linens down the front stairs and out the front door and left them in the front yard. He went back and moved the box spring off the bed frame and leaned it against the wall, examining it to make sure there were no blood stains. After that, he disassembled the metal bed frame, carried it downstairs and set it in the backyard, planning to use the hose to clean it later. He returned to the bedroom with a bucket of warm water with a household cleaner and scrubbed the walls and floor. The only thing left to do in the bedroom was patch three holes in the wall where the bullets had hit. Now, he had to make it appear that Margot had left him. He started by taking a suitcase from the closet and filling it with her underwear and stockings. Those would go with the mattress and bloody bed linens. Next, he filled a box with all of her shoes, and in another larger box, he put all of her clothes. All of these things went out to the front yard. With everything, Reddy Jackson went to the barn, got a one-gallon glass jug, filled it with gasoline and put that in the back of Adler's car, and then pulled the car around to the front of the house. Jackson put Margot's shoes and clothes on the front seat, then put the mattress, the pillowcase, and the suitcase in the back. With the car loaded, Jackson headed south toward Philadelphia. His first stop was a wooded area that was being cleared of trees to build houses. Jackson had passed by this area several times, and knew that there was an area where the workers had been burning piles of brush and trees. Jackson made sure there was no other traffic in the area before pulling into the site. He backed the car up to a small pile of brush that had not completely burned. 
Jackson removed the mattress from the car and put it on top of the brush pile, and then tossed the pillowcase with the bed linens and Adler's clothes on the stack. Next, he opened the suitcase with Margot's underwear and put it on the pile. Jackson doused the mattress, pillowcase, and contents of the suitcase with gasoline then poured a trail of the fuel from the mattress over to the left side of the car. Jackson tossed the empty glass jug into the brush pile, then got in the car and started the engine. Jackson pulled a pack of matches out of his pocket. He lit a match and dropped it, but it went out before it reached the ground. He lit and dropped another match, and this time he was on target. As soon as the flames started toward the brush pile, he accelerated out of the lot. He had only gone about 10 yards before the whole brush pile ignited. Jackson did not hang around to see if everything burned. Jackson continued to Philadelphia, arriving there just after 5 a.m. Jackson found an open diner and stopped for breakfast. After eating, he drove to the loading dock at a Salvation Army donation center. Jackson unloaded the boxes with Margot's shoes and clothes, left them by the door, and drove away. Jackson parked the car two blocks from a rail station with northbound service, then wiped the steering wheel, the door handles, and any other surfaces he touched, then leaving the keys in the ignition, he walked to the station. At 9 a.m., he was headed back to Broderick'sburg. When he got home, he washed the bed frame with Mr. Clean and rinsed it off with the hose. While the bed frame was drying in the backyard, Jackson patched the three holes in the wall and repainted the area. On Monday, he drove to Allentown to buy a new mattress and arranged to have it delivered on Tuesday. He also bought new sheets and pillowcases. By Wednesday, Jackson could see no evidence of what had happened in his bedroom on Halloween night. The new voice started Wednesday night. Jackson, why did you have to kill me? Jackson recognized the voice as Margot's, and it made him break out into a cold sweat. Why couldn't you just let me leave? You cheated me. What did you think I would do? He shouted, but there was no response. The next day Margot's sister, Karen called three times asking for her. Each time Jackson said, she is not home. Karen continued calling daily for the rest of the week, getting the same response from Jackson each time. Each day, the number of times that Margot would speak to Jackson increased. Sometimes she would ask why he killed her, other times she would beg him to let her go. What bothered him the most was when she would talk about how much in love they were when they got married and how much she missed the man he was back then. On November 15, 1959, Detective Mark Rose from the Broderick'sburg Police Department came to the house to see Jackson. He asked Jackson where his wife was, and he told Detective Rose that he didn't know. Did you know that Margot's sister has filed a missing person report on her? The report says that no one has seen your wife since October 30th. If she has been missing for more than two weeks, why didn't you contact the police? Detective Rose said. Because she is not missing, Jackson said. Then where is she? I don't know. Can you explain to me how you can say that you don't know where your wife is, but she is not missing? Jackson told the detective that he had been in Philadelphia on business October 30th and 31st, took the last train back to Broderick'sburg, and caught a cab from the train station and got home around 11 o'clock that night. When he went in the house his wife was gone, and he found a note from Margot telling him she was leaving him. He got the note from his office and gave it to Detective Rose. Jackson let the detective look around the house, knowing that he would not find any evidence of what happened on Halloween. While Detective Rose was wandering around the house, Margot was talking to Jackson. Tell him the truth. Tell him how you murdered me. Tell him where I am now, so he can set me free. Jackson had a hard time controlling his emotions during these outbursts from Margot. When Rose was done with his search, which included the cellar and the barn, he told Jackson that he might have more questions for him later. When Detective Rose left, Jackson laughed and said, as if speaking to Margot, they will never find you. On November 24th, Detective Rose was back. What do you want now? Jackson asked. It seems we have another missing person. His name is Jerry Adler. That name ring any bells? No, never heard of him. Why? Jackson said. We believe that Mr. Adler is the man your wife mentioned in her note. So this Adler is the guy she ran off with? Well, I don't think they went anywhere but here. And I am going to find them today, Detective Rose said then handed Jackson a search warrant. This warrant allows us to search every inch of your property. Detective Rose called out, We're ready in here. 
Six police officers entered the house and headed upstairs while Detective Rose told Jackson that he would have to leave the house during the search. When Jackson walked outside, he saw four sheriff deputies heading into the barn and two state troopers launching a small boat onto the pond. Jackson sat on his front porch and watched the troopers as they used a large treble hook to drag the bottom of the pond. Jackson had no concerns about what the officers would find in the pond or the barn. His only concern was that one of the officers in the house might get lucky and accidentally find the latch for the tunnel entrance. Two hours passed before the six officers came out of the house to join the sheriff deputies and the troopers. Ten minutes later, ten more officers arrived, and the twenty-two officers started walking the property looking for any place two bodies may have been buried. After searching the property for more than four hours, the officers reported to Detective Rose that they found no sign of the missing couple. As Detective Rose was getting ready to leave, he looked over at Jackson and said, This isn't over. You are not going to get away with this. Jackson went in the house and poured himself a double shoot of his VO and sat in his office and laughed. I told you they wouldn't find you, Margot. Jackson poured himself another drink, and as he was about to drink, he heard her. I am still going to leave you. I'll find another man to take me away. This time Jackson laughed at her. I told you that you will never leave here, he said, knowing that she wouldn't respond to his words, but she did. You just wait. One day I will be gone again. October 29, 1964. Jackson arrived at the REORP lab on Thursday morning for his 21st semi-annual visit over the last 11 years. In the beginning, the lab was nothing more than a four-room building with some medical equipment, but it began to look like a real scientific lab in recent years. The first room now had 10 lab tables, complete with two Bunsen burners on each table. The second room was the examination room, where Jackson would spend most of his time over the next two days. Off the exam room, there was an office used by the doctors. Jackson had never been allowed in the office. The last room was a bathroom with a shower. The doctors did all of their usual tests Friday afternoon and evening, and then sent Jackson to stay overnight in a hotel two blocks from the lab. When Jackson returned Friday morning for his second day of tests, he noticed that several of the tables had containers of chemicals, both liquid and dry. The names of the substances didn't mean anything to Jackson, so he ignored them. Jackson was halfway across the room when he saw something that got his attention. He saw three flasks on one of the tables, each suspended over a low flame from a Bunsen burner. Each flask contained a different color liquid, one red, one blue, and one green. The sight of those three liquids brought back the memories of entering the supply tent at the atomic test site at Yucca Flat, just before the detonation that resulted in the deaths of the three soldiers assigned to work with him. These were the three chemicals that he fell into that changed his life forever. Jackson worried that the three doctors might be planning another experiment that could endanger more soldiers. When Jackson entered the examination room, he started to ask Dr. Baker what they were planning to do with the red, blue, and green liquids. Before Dr. Baker could answer, Dr. Schmidt said, See Haben no need to know. Dr. Baker nodded in agreement. He is right. You don't have a need to know. These experiments are classified. Now, Sergeant, please strip down and put on your gym shorts and leave your shirt off. Dr. Baker had Jackson perform several physical activities while the doctor monitored his heart rate, breathing, and recovery time. He left Reorp shortly after 4 o'clock and headed back home. Later that night, while Jackson was reading a James Bond novel, he became aware that he had not heard even one word from Margot since he got home. Jackson wondered why she hadn't spoken to him, as she never let him have that much peace before. By 11 o'clock, he realized that he missed hearing her voice. He did not understand why he would miss Margot talking to him, and pondered this when the Virginian spoke to him. She is gone. She left, and you must find her and bring her back to us. Gone? How could she be gone? Jackson asked, but got no response. That's impossible. Margot is dead, and she is locked in the tunnel. Again, there was no response from the Virginian. It can't be, he mumbled, then finished his VO and headed off to bed, where he slept poorly. Saturday, October 31, 1964. Saturday morning. While Jackson was having his coffee, he wondered why he still hadn't heard anything from Margot. She hadn't been silent for so long since the night Jackson put her in the tunnel five years earlier. The more he thought about it, the more he started to believe that she was gone. Had her spirit found a way out of the tunnel? 
Jackson thought about opening the tunnel and check if her body was still there but decided against doing that. He knew that she could not have left, but why wasn't she talking to him? Jackson began to wonder if he was losing his mind. How could he miss hearing the voice of the woman he loved and killed? That evening, Jackson decided to visit the bar that he and Margot used to frequent in Broderick'sburg. He knew it was a crazy idea and that she could not be there, but he had to look anyway. So, at 9 o'clock that night, Jackson walked into the new Delaware Bar and Grill. The name had changed since he had been there with Margot, and he did not recognize anyone there. Jackson went to the bar and ordered a yingling draft, then turned to face the room and leaned against the bar. It was a half hour later when four young women came into the bar and sat at a table on the other side of the room. Jackson didn't see them when they first arrived, and they were already seated when he saw them. He was beginning to think coming out to the bar was a stupid idea and was getting ready to head home when he saw two guys approach the girls' table and ask two of them to dance. When the girls got up to dance, one of them caught Jackson's attention. She was tall and blonde. She was at least four inches taller than the guy with whom she was dancing. Jackson couldn't see her face, but from the back, she looked so much like Margot that his heart began to beat faster. Jackson knew that it could not be Margot, but he had to get a closer look. So he walked over to the dance floor and waited for her to turn so that he could see her face. When he finally got a look at her face, she did not look like Margot. She had blue eyes like Margot, but her mouth and nose were different. The only similarity between this girl and Margot is that they were both tall, blonde, and had blue eyes. He stared at the girl while he tried to decide if he was disappointed or relieved. The next time the tall blonde turned in Jackson's direction, she saw him staring at her and she smiled at him. When the dance ended, instead of going back to her table, the blonde walked over to him and said, You see something you like? As a matter of fact, I do, Jackson said. But if you're going to be my new girlfriend, I will need to know your name. Girlfriend? I don't know about that, but you can buy me a drink, she said. My name is Tina, and it may interest you to know that I'm married. What should I call you? Jackson said, You can call me Michael. So, Where's your husband? If you were my wife, I wouldn't let you come to a place like this without me. My husband is out of town until next Wednesday. So, are you just out for a Halloween drink with your friends? Or are you looking for a bed partner for the night? I don't know. I kind of like the way you look in your confidence, but I don't know if I can trust you. Tina said, Of course you can. Anyway, can anyone else here offer you the chance to make love in a 100 year old haunted house? Jackson said, haunted house? I doubt it. Jackson told Tina the story of the old Cobain house and how the four bounty hunters haunted it. Tina liked the story, and even though she didn't believe in haunted houses or ghosts, Tina agreed to follow him out to the house to spend the night with Jackson. When Tina saw the big house sitting on a hill with no lights on, she felt a chill. For a moment, she wondered if she was making a big mistake by agreeing to come home with Michael. He led Tina into the dark kitchen and turned on the light. While Tina looked around the room, Jackson made her a VO and 7-Up. He made it a double and poured himself a shot. He spent the next 20 minutes showing Tina around the house, ending the tour outside the bedroom. Are you ready? Jackson said as he went into the bedroom ahead of Tina. When they entered the room, Jackson began kissing Tina, and as the kissing got more passionate, he opened her blouse, and while kissing between Tina's jugs, Jackson helped Tina remove her skirt, then he lifted her onto the bed and started removing his clothes. When he was naked, once Jackson had penetrated Tina, he looked at her face, and what he saw shocked him. She looked like Margot. He felt a sudden surge of arousal and anger. Jackson stopped being gentle and started pounding. While Tina was sleeping, Jackson sat up and studied her face. He knew that this woman was not Margot, but she looked like her which disturbed him enough to make him get up and leave the room. He retreated to his office and sat at the desk, wondering how this woman could have no resemblance to Margot one minute and the next look exactly like her. His reverie was interrupted by the Virginian's voice. You brought her back. Now you must make certain that she stays. Jackson didn't question what the Virginian said, because he knew what he had to do. He was going to retrieve his pistol from its hiding place in the tunnel and started to get up when he remembered the mess the gun made the last time. So instead, he removed his belt and headed up to the bedroom. When he returned to the bedroom, Tina was still sleeping. 
Jackson slipped the end of the belt through the buckle to form a loop and then lifted Tina so he could get the loop around her neck. He pulled the loop tight, cutting off Tina's airways. Tina woke in a panic and struggled to get free, but she was no match for Jackson's strength, and after just a couple of minutes, she gave up the fight. He checked the pulse in her neck and not finding one. He carried her naked body down to the tunnel and placed her next to Margot's remains. After sealing up the tunnel, Jackson drove Tina's car down to Philadelphia and parked it on Broad Street and left the keys in the ignition. When Jackson was home again and getting ready for bed, the Virginian whispered, You must remain vigilant. October 29, 1987 Finally, at 2 o'clock on Thursday, after completing his 63rd physical at RURP, Dr. Baker told Jackson to shower and return to the examination room because the doctor wanted to talk to him. When he returned to the examination room with his shoes in his hand, Dr. Baker was already waiting for him. Sergeant, we need you to return next week so that Dr. Schmidt can get a sample of your lung tissue and a small sample from your liver. How's he going to do that? It'll have to be done surgically. No, I am not letting that Nazi operate on me, Jackson said. Sergeant, this is part of the agreement you made, Dr. Baker said. Then I quit, Jackson said. Dr. Baker shook his head. You will not be allowed to quit. There are powerful people involved, and they will not let you walk away. Do you understand? Jackson understood. It was a threat, and it angered him. He would have to do something to end this nightmare. Jackson nodded his head, indicating that he understood the threat. Good. I will contact you to let you know when to be here. Jackson sat down to put his shoes on, and Dr. Baker retreated into the office, but before the door closed, Jackson saw that Schmidt and Bradshaw were in the office waiting. He hated the idea that these old men, all the three of them were at least 75 years old, were in control of his life. With shoes on, Jackson left the examination room and walked into the lab. He stopped and saw that the doctors were cooking up a batch of red, blue, and green chemicals again. He looked at the low flames from the Bunsen burners under the flasks and wondered what would happen if he turned the burners up. Would it destroy their experiments? He realized destroying the chemicals would not stop them. It would only delay them. Then another idea came to him. Jackson went over to the red flask and turned the gas down until the flame barely showed above the top of the burner. Then he turned off the gas under the blue and green flasks, and when the flame went out, he turned the gas back on full. On his way out of the lab, he opened the gas valves for several more Bunsen burners. Jackson left the building and walked quickly down to the bus stop to wait for the bus to take him to the train station. The bus arrived five minutes later. He had just taken his seat and looked out the window toward the Reorp lab as the bus began to move. Suddenly, the whole front wall of the lab blew out, followed by a ball of fire. The explosion shook the bus violently, and many of the passengers began screaming and yelling, but not Jackson. He sat quietly with a smile on his lips. He continued to watch as the roof collapsed and the fire grew in intensity. The bus stayed at the scene until a police officer told the driver to leave. As the bus pulled away, Jackson looked back at the remains of Reorp and smiled. He got home a little after 6 o'clock Thursday evening. He felt good about what he did to the lab, but he wanted to know what happened to the doctors. Jackson poured a double VO and headed in to watch the evening news on the CBS affiliate in Philadelphia. The story was near the end of the broadcast. The headline from the news anchor was, Explosion in a Medical Laboratory Kills Three. Fire Marshal Rules the Explosion an Accident. When Jackson heard that, he took his drink down in one swallow and then refilled his glass. He didn't bother to listen to the rest of the story. He heard what he needed to hear. He was free. October 31, 1987. The fourth time Margot escaped, it took Jackson almost five months to find her. Margot had stopped speaking to him in May, but he wasn't sure she was gone until the middle of June when the Virginian told him that she was gone. Jackson spotted her the first week of October in a place called Raffles in Bethlehem. Raffles had live music on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday nights and drew a good crowd. Her name was Jennifer and she came to Raffles every Saturday night because her husband worked Saturday nights and would not be home until Sunday afternoon. Jennifer had danced with him several times on the three previous Saturday nights and had hinted to Jackson that she hoped that he would come to Raffles on Halloween. That is when he was sure that he had found Margot. While dancing with Jennifer on Halloween night, Jackson asked her if she would spend the night with him. Why would I want to do that? Jennifer asked. 
When will you get another chance to spend Halloween night in a haunted house that is over 100 years old and have the greatest sex of your life? Jennifer smiled at him and asked, Where is this haunted house, and how do you know about it? It's my house, Jackson said, and then told her the story about the dead bounty hunters that haunted the house. Sounds like fun. Let's go. Jackson knew she would go with him. He knew that Margot wanted to come home, just like she did the previous three times he had to find and bring her home. Jackson believed that when Margot's spirit escaped the tunnel, she would find a woman that looked like her when she was alive to possess to make it easier for Jackson to find her. Then she would go dancing and have fun while waiting for him to come to get her. And, just like all of her other adventures, this one ended the same way. Jackson took Jennifer home, but made love to Margot. Afterward, Jackson returned Margot to her resting place in the tunnel. Saturday, October 31, 1998. Margot had been gone this time for only five days when Jackson found her. Jackson met Jane Markle the night before Halloween in a bar in Bethlehem. After drinking and dancing with her most of the night, he invited her to spend Halloween in his haunted house. He knew that she would not say no, because Margot wanted to come home. That Saturday night, Jane drove to Broderick'sburg and went to Jackson's house where he had sex with her body, but it was Margot that he was making love to in his mind. Then, as always, he returned Margot to the tunnel. Tuesday, December 15, 1998. Brian Hobbs was starting his third week as a detective in the Broderick'sburg Police Department. Previously, Detective Hobbs had been a detective on the Baltimore Police Force, but decided that he would prefer to work for his hometown police department. When Brian came into the station that Tuesday morning, Chief Paziak called him into his office. Detective, I need you to work this missing person investigation. The MP's name is Mrs. Jane Markle. Mrs. Markle is a 26-year-old housewife reported missing by her husband in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. She is 6 feet tall, weighs 145 pounds, and has blonde hair and blue eyes. It turns out that Mrs. Markle had told a friend that she was going to drive down to Broderick'sburg to celebrate Halloween in a haunted house with a man she had met. She hasn't been seen since October 30th. She's been missing for more than a month. Why are we just getting this now? Hobbs asked. Bethlehem PD has been investigating this and just interviewed one of Mrs. Markle's friends who told them of Mrs. Markle's plans to come to Broderick'sburg. If she hasn't turned up by now, this probably isn't going to end well, but see what you can find out. Detective Hobbs interviewed John Markle, the husband. Mr. Markle said that he had been out of town on business and didn't return until Tuesday, November 3rd. He told Hobbs that his wife wasn't home and her car was gone. Mr. Markle said that he called some of her friends, and they told him that they had not seen Jane since Friday, the 30th. Detective Hobbs interviewed the friend that told the Bethlehem police that Mrs. Markle was going to Broderick'sburg. The friend told him that no one told Mr. Markle about the wife's plan to go to Broderick'sburg with a friend because they knew it was a man and didn't want to tell Mr. Markle that his wife was cheating on him. Detective Hobbs worked the case for three months without a break. Detective Hobbs found no evidence that Mrs. Markle had been in Broderick'sburg, nor could he find information about a haunted house being set up for Halloween anywhere in Broderick'sburg. A bolo for her car turned up nothing. A month later, Hobbs got a call from Bethlehem PD informing him that Mrs. Markle's car was found abandoned in Philadelphia, and the case got moved into the unsolved case file. Saturday, October 31, 2015. Jackson stood in front of his bathroom mirror, getting ready for his date with Tracy Johnson. He just wondered how ready Tracy Johnson would be for her last night out. In recent years, he seemed to be spending more time looking at his reflection. The accident at Yucca Flat was 62 years ago, but Jackson looks exactly the same as he did when he was still Michael Bliss. Sometimes he wondered if he would ever grow old. I'm going to live forever, Jackson said out loud and laughed. This time Margot left in September, but instead of making Jackson look for her, she came to him. In reading, looking at a Mustang he was thinking of buying, Jackson heard someone speaking to him. What did you say? Jackson said as he turned to see who was talking. She was tall, blonde and blue-eyed. I was asking you if you were going to buy this car. She said. Jackson saw her wedding ring and said, I was thinking about it, Mrs. Johnson, Tracy Johnson. Nice to meet you, Tracy. I am Michael. Can I ask you why you care if I buy this car? Oh, I don't care. I just think you would look good in it. If I buy it, 
Will you go for a ride with me? Buy the car and then ask me. Jackson bought the Mustang and Tracy Johnson went for a ride with him. When he brought he back to the car dealership, he asked Tracy to go out with him on Halloween. I'm a married woman. It wouldn't be proper for me to go on a date with you. Oh, come on. You know you want to. Just say yes, and I promise you a night you won't forget. Tracy leaned against Jackson and kissed him on the cheek and said, I will be in Allentown at the Marriott with some friends on Halloween. Why don't you meet me there? Jackson walked into the Marriott at 10 o'clock on Halloween, found Tracy in the bar, and talked her into following him home. He showed Tracy around the house and even told her about the hidden tunnel and the dead bounty hunters inside. Can I see the tunnel? Tracy asked. Sure. After I show you my bedroom, Jackson said. He wasn't worried about telling Tracy about the tunnel because that is where she would be spending eternity. Jackson had stopped feeling guilty about what he was doing after the third time. He blamed Margot for making him kill these women. If she would just stay in the tunnel where she belonged, he would not have to find her and bring her back. He took Tracy to the bedroom and made slow, passionate love to her, and then strangled her. He lovingly placed Tracy's body in the tunnel with the eight other women he had killed. Meanwhile, Detective was busy with his investigation. Tuesday, November 10, 2015. I was working the crossword puzzle in the Philadelphia Inquirer when my phone rang. I picked up the phone and said, Captain Hobbs, good morning, Brian. Special Agent Van Horn here. Good morning, Kyle. What can I do for you? I've got a missing person case I'd like you to take a look at, Van Horn said. I faxed a copy of the original NPR to you. You might want to look at that while we talk. Hang on a sec while I get your fax. Back in my office, I closed the door, put the phone on speaker to talk and read the missing person report, NPR, at the same time. Got it, I said. Give me a second to read through it. The NPR was for Tracy Johnson, reported missing from Reading, Pennsylvania, on November 5th, by her husband. Mrs. Johnson's description said that she was 25 years old. She had blonde hair and blue eyes, 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighed 135 pounds. Last seen the evening of October 30th. The report included a picture of the woman and a description of the car that she was driving the night she disappeared. There isn't much here, Kyle. What did the husband have to say? He was out of town on business and returned home on Sunday, November 1st. Mr. Johnson talked to his wife Saturday morning, and she told him she was going to the Allentown Marriott with some friends to attend a Halloween party, Van Horn said. We spoke with her friends, and they said the last time they saw Tracy, she told them she was going to a haunted house in Broderick'sburg with some guy she met. Not again, I said, mostly to myself. Not again? What do you mean by not again, Van Horn said. Nothing. It's just that these cases always bother me. My experience is that they often don't end well. Anyway, we did a credit card check on Mrs. Johnson, and the last activity on her credit card was a charge for drinks at the Allentown Marriott. Van Horn said, We'll check it out from this end and find out if Mrs. Johnson came to Broderick'sburg. Knew I could count on you. Keep me informed. 5.45 p.m., November 13, 2015 I was sitting in my office trying to concentrate on the five cold case, missing person files I had in front of me. These cases were in addition to the one that arrived on my desk on Tuesday. My back was starting to hurt from being bent over my desk studying the files, looking for something that would help me make sense of them. Captain Hobbs, do you need me to pull any more files for you? Sergeant McKinstry asked as he stood in my doorway. No, I am getting nowhere, and I need to leave soon. Carrie and I are going out to dinner tonight and I need to get home and change. I'll be leaving shortly. In that case, I'll be heading home myself, Sergeant McKinstry said. I looked up at the clock and realized that I had been staring at these old files for the last five and a half hours. Just then, Rich Hanrady stepped into the office. I thought you would have gone home by now, Hanrady said. Carrie and Linda will be pissed if we are late for our reservation. I am getting ready to leave soon. Just let me lock these files in my desk, and I'll walk you out. I said. So, what have you been able to find out about our missing person? Well, you know that I went over to Parks and Recreation and talked to them about the haunted funhouse they set up for Halloween. I showed the picture of Mrs. Johnson around, but no one there could remember seeing her. I sent the footage from the security cameras that were active in the park on October 31st to the FBI, Hannity said. I also contacted Consolidated Entertainment, 
the company that provided the amusements for the Halloween celebration. They had cameras set up to capture the faces of everyone who came through their haunted house. I got them to send the files of all the pictures they took to Van Horn. The FBI is running all of the pictures through facial recognition to see if our MP had been to the fun house. That was on Friday. No results yet. Mrs. Johnson has been missing for a month now. I'm not very hopeful that this will have a happy ending, I said. Hell, we don't even know for sure if she came here. I hope that she didn't, but I have a bad feeling about this. Is that why you are looking at all these cold cases? Hannity asked. This missing person case made me think of these old cases. I have a feeling in my gut that these old cases are somehow linked with this new one. Hanrady looked at the files on my desk. Are you serious? You think this case and the one from 1959 are connected? Sounds crazy. I know, but that first case was 56 years ago. We need to talk about this, Hanrady said. I've asked Van Horn to come up Monday morning, and I want you in the meeting, I said. Right now, we need to get moving, or you and I may be celebrating the new year alone. I locked the files in my desk and walked out of the station with Rich. When Rich reached his car, he turned to me and said, See you at seven, and the first round of drinks is on you. I guess I can afford to buy a ginger ale for you. That ginger ale better have at least two shots of Jack in it, Rich said as he drove away. Monday, November 23, 2015 Hanrady came into the department conference room Thursday morning with a box of Dunkin' Donuts and a large thermos of their coffee and sat down at the table. He was starting to pour us some coffee when Special Agent Van Horn walked in. Is that coffee and donuts I smell? Van Horn said. Can't have a proper meeting of law officers without them, Hanrady said. That's why I like coming up here. You guys know how to hold, as you put it, a proper meeting. When the three of us each had a cup of coffee and had selected one of the treats Hanrady brought, Van Horn asked, Is this meeting about our missing person from reading? It's that and more, I said. Why don't we start with you telling us what your people have found? Van Horn smiled and said, Not much, except that we may now have evidence that Mrs. Johnson never came to Brodericksburg. What evidence is that? I said, We found her car. Let me guess, you found it in Philadelphia, I said. How did you know that? Van Horn replied. I'll get into that later. What else you got? The car was found parked along Broad Street with the keys still in the ignition. We think that Mrs. Johnson may have come down to Philly to meet someone and something went terribly wrong. Why are we just hearing about this now? Hanrady asked. We didn't find out about it until Friday afternoon, Van Horn said. Philly PD found the car in early November before we were even looking for it. Last week, they were comparing the list of plate numbers from abandoned cars they found against their list of cars reported stolen when someone saw the bolo we put out for that car. That explains what happened to the car, but it doesn't explain what happened to Mrs. Johnson, I said. Maybe she did go to Philly, and something happened to her while she was there. Let's put that aside for now. I have another possibility to present that is stranger and much more disturbing. Van Horn and Hanrady were both staring at me now. The first case I worked on when I started here in December of 1998 was a missing person case from October 1998. The case hit my desk and detailed the disappearance of Jane Markle. Jane was a 26-year-old housewife reported missing by her husband in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Markle had told a friend that she was going to drive down to Brodericksburg to celebrate Halloween in a haunted house with a man she had met. When I went up to Bethlehem to speak with Mr. Markle, he told me that he had been out of town on business and returned on Tuesday, November 3rd. When he got home, his wife wasn't there and her car was gone. Mr. Markle called some of her friends and they all said that they had not seen Jane since Friday, the 30th. The friends never told Mr. Markle about the wife's plan to go to Brodericksburg with a friend because they knew she was going with a man and didn't want to tell Markle that his wife was cheating on him. I worked the case for three months without a break. I could never find any reason for Mrs. Markle to come to Brodericksburg, found no evidence that she had been here, and we didn't find Mrs. Markle's car anywhere near Brodericksburg. A month later, I got a call from a police sergeant in Bethlehem, and he told me that the police found Mrs. Markle's car in Philly. You're kidding, Van Horn said. You don't think it's a coincidence? Hanrady said. Could be, but I don't think it is. Maybe Mrs. Markle's description might help you understand my concern. Mrs. Markle was six feet tall, weighed 145 pounds, 
and had blonde hair and blue eyes. Jesus sounds just like Mrs. Johnson, Hanrity said. Eventually, I had to move my investigation of the case to our cold files. When I saw Mrs. Johnson's description in the NPR, I went to the cold files to pull the Jane Markle file to compare the two cases. While I was in the file room, I found four similar missing person cases predating the Tracy Johnson case we are investigating. When I began studying the other case files, it left me with an uneasy feeling. On the surface, the cases seemed to be unrelated. The oldest case, from 1959, involved two missing people. The first person reported missing was Margot Winslow, a 26-year-old woman from Broderick'sburg. Her husband was a man named Jackson Winslow, and they lived out on the old Cobain place. She was reported missing by her sister in Broderick'sburg on November 15th of 1959. What's the old Cobain place? Van Horn asked. The Cobain place is on Wismer Road and dates back to the 1840s. Quimby Cobain built the place, and the Cobain family owned the farm until 1954. It's been referred to as the old Cobain place as long as I can remember. I said, Mrs. Winslow's sister, Karen Bush, and her husband Howard hadn't seen Margot since the day before Halloween, and Karen couldn't get Margot on the phone. Mr. Winslow would not tell Karen where Margot was, so she went to the police. A detective, Mark Rose of the Broderick'sburg PD, interviewed Mr. Winslow, a man the detective described as a 32-year-old male who looked more like 25. Jackson Winslow was 6 foot 5 and well-built. When Detective Rose asked Winslow where his Margot was, Winslow said that he didn't know. Rose asked Winslow, if you don't know where your wife is, why didn't you file a missing person report? Winslow replied that his wife wasn't missing. She just wasn't there anymore. The circular conversation finally stopped when Winslow told the officer that his wife left him for another man. What Rose finally got out of Winslow was that he had been in Philadelphia on business October 30th and 31st and got back home around 11 o'clock that Saturday night. Winslow told Rose that his wife was home when he left on Friday morning, but was gone when he returned Saturday night. Winslow told Detective Rose that Margot left him a note stating that she was leaving him. Winslow still had the note, and he gave it to Detective Rose. It's here in the file. I handed the note to Van Horn. He read it and gave it to Hanrity. Winslow gave the detective permission to look around the property, so Detective Rose explored the house and barn but didn't find any evidence that would indicate that Mrs. Winslow met with foul play. Rose did find that somebody had removed Mrs. Winslow's belongings from the house. At that time, Detective Rose believed that Mrs. Winslow had probably run off with her lover. You're not going to tell us that the police found her car in Philadelphia, are you? Hanrity said. No, but there is more to this story, I said. In December, there was another missing person report. This one for a 28-year-old man named Jerry Adler. Adler had lived in Broderick'sburg for just six months before he was reported missing by his parents, who lived in Allentown. They had been trying to get in touch with their son for three weeks before they called the police. Detective Rose was assigned to the case and went to Adler's apartment, where he found the door padlocked. The landlord told Detective Rose that Adler hadn't paid his rent for November and that the door was locked so that Adler couldn't sneak back and take anything from the apartment until he paid his back rent. The detective had the landlord remove the lock, and then he went inside. There was an open suitcase on the bed and, Mr. Adler's clothes were folded neatly on the bed, as if he were preparing to pack them for a trip. Other than Mr. Adler preparing to pack his suitcase, the room seemed to be in order. No sign of foul play. It looked as though Adler was planning to go somewhere, but he never finished packing. Detective Rose talked to Adler's neighbors but no one knew Adler very well and had no idea where he might have been planning to go or how long he had been missing. One neighbor did say that he had seen Adler out one night with a tall blonde woman. Because Adler had paid his rent for October, but not for November, Detective Rose believed that Adler had probably disappeared about the same time Mrs. Winslow did. The fact that someone saw Adler with a woman who fits Margot Winslow's description caused Detective Rose to believe that Adler's disappearance was connected to the Winslow case. Rose concluded that Adler was the other man mentioned in Mrs. Winslow's note. Detective Rose said that his best guess is that whatever happened to the two of them probably happened on Halloween. Based on his belief that Alder was the man that Mrs. Winslow planned to leave with, Detective Rose got a search warrant and went back out to the Cobain farm with several officers. They went through the house again, searched the barn, 
and then walk the property looking for signs of a burial site. They also dragged the pond. They found nothing. Care to guess where Mr. Alder's car was found? Philly? Van Horn said. Give that man a cigar, I said. Since you got that one right, would you? Care to take a crack at describing Mrs. Winslow? Tall, blue-eyed blonde? Yep. Mrs. Winslow and Mr. Alder's cases were kept active for nearly a year before being put in the unsolved case file. Detective Rose put a note in the file stating that he believed that Mr. Winslow was responsible for the disappearance of both Mrs. Winslow and Mr. Adler, but with no hard evidence and no bodies, he had to file the cases unsolved. The next missing person file I read was from 1964 and concerned the disappearance of Tina Bollinger from Trenton, but living in Cutstown where she met and began dating James Parker, I said. The two of them had been together for almost two years. Mr. Parker said that he was a restaurant manager and had to work Halloween night, and that Tina was going to go out with friends and would see him after he got off from work. He never saw her again. Mr. Parker filed the MPR on November 3rd. This is where things start to get strange. Friends of Ms. Bollinger said that she told them that she was going over to Pennsylvania to visit a haunted house. Oh crap, Hanrity said. What haunted house were they talking about? No one knew. The police found no evidence that Ms. Bollinger had ever been in Broderick'sburg. Then, a month later, her car turned up. In Philadelphia? Hanrity asked. In all of these cases, the subjects were from all over southeastern Pennsylvania. All the subjects were between 24 and 27 years old, and all of these women fur the same description as tall, blue-eyed blondes, I said. These cases sound very similar, too similar. The women all fit the same description, all went missing on or around Halloween, and the cars associated with every case were found abandoned in Philadelphia. Are you suggesting we have a serial killer here? Do you think one person is responsible for the disappearance of all six of these women and one man? Hell, the first case was 1959. So if this perp started when he was 20, he would be 66 years old, Van Horn said. I don't know what to think, I said. I know this doesn't seem to make sense. I told you this would be strange and disturbing. In what years did these women go missing? Hanrity asked. I said, 1959 it was Margot Winslow. Then in 1964 it was Brenda Clark, in 1917 a Bollinger, in 1981, Karen Martin, in 1998 Jane Markle, and this year, it's Tracy Johnson. Hanrity opened his laptop and started typing. When he stopped, he looked up at me and then at Van Horn. Are we in agreement that the disappearances of these women and Mr. Adler are the result of foul play and that they are likely all dead? I looked over at Van Horn and he nodded his head. I agree. I said. Then, if you are right that this is the work of a serial killer and he is following a pattern, then there may be three more missing women that we don't know about, Hanrity said. What do you mean? Van Horn said. What are you talking about, Rich? I asked. If I am right about the pattern I see in the six cases we have here, the disappearances seem to have happened on Halloween. In each of the years you listed, Halloween fell on a Saturday. Well, Halloween also fell on Saturday in 1987. 1992, and 2009. We may very well have three more tall, blonde, blue-eyed women missing. The room was silent while we each considered what Hanrity said. I looked at Van Horn and said, can you search FBI files to see if there were any NPRs that fit this pattern in 1970, 1992, and 2009? They would have to be cases not brought to the Brodericksburg PD's attention, or we would already have those files. Maybe the Philadelphia PD has a file of abandoned cars found after Halloween in those years. We should also check to see if there have been any similar cases before 1959. If this is the pattern of a serial killer, we had better catch him now because if this case goes cold, Halloween 2020 falls on a Saturday, Hanrity said. This is crazy, Van Horn said. You think that we may have a serial killer that has been active for 56 years? Van Horn was reading the cold case files as he spoke. I would be easier to believe this if all these women disappeared over 10 years, but over 56 years is hard to fathom. There is something else all of these women have in common, I said. Van Horn was still reading the files, and he held up his hand to indicate he saw it too. All of these missing women were cheating on their husbands, or in one case, her boyfriend, possibly with the killer. I pointed at Van Horn and said, Bingo! In the first case in 1959, Margot Winslow was planning on leaving her husband, 
which is why Jackson Winslow was a likely suspect in her disappearance. According to Detective Rose's notes, Jackson Winslow was 32 when Margot Winslow went missing, which would make him 88 years old if he is still alive. If Mr. Winslow was responsible for whatever happened to his wife and Mr. Adler, can we assume that he is responsible for any of the other missing women? I looked at Hanrity and Van Horn and waited to hear what they thought. I think it is likely that Winslow was responsible for whatever happened to his wife and Adler, but why would he start killing women that looked like his wife, but only on October 31st when it fell on a Saturday? Van Horn said, If Winslow is still alive and 88 years old, could he still be going after women who remind him of his wife? And how could he manage to get these women to go with him? And where would he take them? Or is it possible that he has someone else carrying on for him? Hanrity said, I don't have answers, only more questions, I said. I need to find out more about Jackson Winslow. I think I will take a ride out to the old Cobain place and see if Mr. Winslow is still with us. Kyle, can you check if any women who matched Mrs. Winslow's description were reported missing around the three dates Rich suggested? I want to get together again after the holiday. Can you come back up the first week of December? Let me see what I can find out, and if I have any news, I'll come back up. I will also check with Philadelphia PD to see about abandoned cars they found on those dates, but I don't have much hope that we'll turn anything up there after all this time. November 24, 2015 On Tuesday, Hanrity and I drove out to the old Cobain place to see if we could find out if Jackson Winslow was still alive and where to find him. We got no answer at the door and were about to leave when a man came out of the barn and approached us. The man looked to be about 25 years old and was at least 6'5 and built like an athlete. Is there something I can do for you? The young man asked. Yes, I am Captain Brian Hobbs and this Lieutenant Hanrity from the Brodericksburg Police Department. And you are? My name is Michael Bliss. Now, what is it you want? We were hoping to speak with Mr. Winslow. He's not here. Can you tell us where we might find him? Don't know. He doesn't tell me what he's doing, Bliss said. Does he still live here? Sometimes. Do you work for Mr. Winslow? I take care of the place, Bliss said. Now, if you don't mind, I have work to do. With that, Bliss turned and walked back into the barn. On the ride back into town, I asked Hanrity, wasn't very helpful, was he? He kind of fits the description of Jackson Winslow in the Margot Winslow file, Hanrity said. I was thinking that, too. I wonder if the two of them are related. I'll have to look into that. I wonder if Mrs. Winslow's sister is still around. I think I would like to talk to her. I dropped Hanrity off at the station, and after getting an address for Karen Bush, Margot's sister, I drove over to her house. I was greeted at the door by a man in his mid 50s. I identified myself then asked him about Mrs. Howard Bush. He told me his name was Howard Bush Jr., then informed me that his mother had died three years ago. Is there something I can help me with? We're looking into the disappearance of your aunt back in 1959. That was before I was born, but I remember my parents talking about it. My mom was always sad that she never found out what happened to her sister. Did your mother or father ever tell you what they think happened to your aunt? They both believe that her husband killed her. Do you know if your mother had any pictures of her sister and her husband? I still have her family album. I think it's still in the bookcase. Let me check. Howard returned with the album and handed it to me. The most interesting picture to me was of Margot and Jackson at their wedding in 1954. I looked through the rest of the album, but that was the only photo that showed Jackson Winslow. Any chance I could borrow this picture so I can get a copy made? You can have that one. I didn't know either of the people in the picture, so it has no meaning for me. I thanked Mr. Bush and headed back to the station. When I got back to my office, Hanrity was out investigating a break-in at a plumbing supply warehouse. The report said that someone had taken several coils of copper tubing. I didn't see Hanrity again until Monday, Thursday, December 3, 2015. Hanrity and I were sitting in the conference room drinking our coffee when Van Horn came in, dropped a file folder on the table, Got a cup of coffee and a donut, then sat down. Van Horn smiled and said, Gotta get my FBI associates to learn how to arrange proper meetings. So that's why you always come here instead of inviting us to your office? Hanrity said, Not the only reason. I looked at the file folder on the table, then said, I hope you have something for us. I found three possible matches. The women in these cases fit Margot Winslow's description, 
but only two were reported as missing persons. In November of 1987, Robert Swenson was arrested in the disappearance of his wife, Jennifer. Mrs. Jennifer Swenson was 26 years old, 5 feet 10 inches tall. Her eyes were blue, and she had blonde hair. Van Horn pulled two copies of the Swenson file out of the folder and handed them to us. Mr. Swenson was a security guard at a warehouse complex in Allentown. In October of 87, he worked the graveyard shift, 11 p.m., till 7 a.m. Tuesday through Sunday. On Saturday, October 31st, Jennifer Swenson told her husband she would spend the night at a friend's house watching scary Halloween movies. At 9.30 that night, a friend of Mr. Swenson called him and said that Jennifer was at raffles in Bethlehem and she was dancing with some guy, and it looked like they were more than just friends. Swenson called Andy Miller, the other guard on duty that night, and told Andy that he was going to have to leave for a family emergency. Swenson drove up to Bethlehem and went to raffles. Swenson went into raffles looking for his wife, and his friend told him that Jennifer left a few minutes earlier with some guy. Witnesses said that Swenson was livid and calling his wife a cheating, which in saying that she would regret cheating on him. When Jennifer didn't show up for work that Monday morning and no one could get her on the phone, her boss called the police. Swenson told the police that he hadn't seen his wife since that Saturday evening and no one else had seen her. Allentown PD believed that Swenson might have killed his wife, but they could find no evidence to support that theory. Swenson took his own life six months later, so Allentown PD closed the case. Van Horn stopped long enough to let that sink in. Allentown PD never tried to find the man Mrs. Swenson left the bar with. All they had on him was that he was very tall and quite handsome, and one of Mrs. Swenson's friends thinks his name may have been Michael. I looked at Hanrity and said, Michael? Another coincidence? You think this might be the same Michael we met last week? Hanrity said, You think this guy you met could be the same? Michael? Van Horn said. I don't know, but let's talk about that later. Tell us what else you found, I said. The other two cases are similar to the previous one. Both women fit the description, and both disappeared on Halloween. And it appeared that the two women were stepping out on their husbands. In 1992, it was 24-year-old Pamela Garner, from Scranton. Mrs. Garner told her husband that she was going to Syracuse, New York, to visit her sister. Mr. Garner reported his wife missing three days later when he found out that she never arrived in Syracuse and that her sister wasn't expecting her. The Scranton police and the state police of both Pennsylvania and New York found nothing to indicate where Mrs. Garner went or what happened to her. The last case was for Mrs. Emily Redmond of Philadelphia. Same description as the others disappeared on Halloween in 2009. Mrs. Redmond was taking classes toward her master's degree in education at Penn State. Lehigh Valley. Mrs. Redmond told the girl she was staying with that her friend Michael, who was taking her to see a haunted house. When Mrs. Redmond didn't return to campus on Monday, her roommate called her husband to see if she had gone home, and he filed the NPR. The police tried tracking her cell phone, but there hadn't been any activity on her phone since she left campus on Halloween. So now we have nine, I said. Did you find anything before 1959? Nothing that fits with what we are looking at here. Van Horn said. So, tell me about this guy you met out at the Cobain place. I told Van Horn about our visit to the Cobain farm and meeting Michael Bliss. I think Rich would back me up that this guy fits the description of Jackson Winslow. Rich nodded his head and then described the man we met. After we visited the farm, I went to Karen Bush's house. Karen was Margot's sister. I spoke with her son. Mrs. Bush passed away three years ago. I pulled the picture of Jackson and Margot Winslow from my pocket and showed it to Van Horn and Hanrity. That looks like Michael Bliss. Who's the woman? Hanrity asked. That's Margot, and the man is Jackson Winslow, not Michael Bliss. This picture is from their wedding in 1954. Bliss looks enough like Winslow that they could be the same person, but Winslow would be at least in his 80s, Hanrity said. You think Bliss could be Winslow's son or grandson? I think that would be good to know don't you? I said, we have to start somewhere, so I am going with Detective Rose's gut feeling on this. Since all of this began with the disappearance of Margot Winslow, I am going to dig up everything I can about Jackson Winslow. Rich, I was hoping you could do the same with Michael Bliss. We need to see what the connection is between these two. Kyle, can you keep digging to see if you can find anything we haven't discovered on any of these cases? 
I'll get a couple of guys on this when I get back to Philly. After Van Horn left, I went over to Chief Paziak's office. When he saw me at his door, the chief waved me in. I noticed that Special Agent Van Horn was here again today. Can you bring me up to speed on what the three of you are working on? The chief said, we are looking at nine unsolved missing person cases that might be related. Related in what way? All nine of these cases involve a missing woman. In eight cases, the women were married, and in one case, the woman was in a serious relationship. In the first case, there was also a report of a missing man. In all of the cases, the women fit the same description as nearly six feet tall, with blonde hair and blue eyes. When I said that, the chief leaned forward and said, Go on. As near as we can tell, the women all went missing on October 31st, but in different years. Now is where the story gets strange. The first was in 1959, the next in 1964, then 1970, 1981, 1987, 1992, 1998, 2009, and then again this year. I waited for the chief to digest what I had told him. This has been going on for 56 years? On Halloween? Is there any significance to the years? In each of those years, October 31st fell on a Saturday. 56 years, and you think they could all be connected? That is what we are trying to find out, I said. It's hard to believe that we could have a serial event happening over that long a period and only on those specific dates, the chief said. You think one person is responsible for all nine cases? That's hard to imagine because our prime candidate for the first case would be 88 years old now. We think someone else must be involved. Who was the first victim? Margot Winslow. She was married to Jackson Winslow, and they lived out at the old Cobain place, I said. My friends and I used to go ice skating on their pond when it froze over. That was back in 65 or 66, I think. I remember that big old house. There used to be a story about the old Cobain place being haunted. The chief said, that got my attention. Haunted? My father told me that back in the 1850s, Quimby Cobain, the guy who built the house, killed somebody and hid the body somewhere on the farm and that the dead man was haunting the property. I don't know if anybody believed it, but people like ghost stories. I never heard anyone say that the Cobain place was haunted. Why is that important? Before going missing, Four of these women had told a friend that they were either going to see a haunted house or spend the night in one. In a couple of these cases, the name Michael came up as a potential person of interest. Hannity and I were out at the Cobain place last week, and we met a guy named Michael Bliss. Mr. Bliss looked to be about 25 and bears a striking resemblance to Jackson Winslow. I showed the picture of Jackson and Margot Winslow to the chief. It's almost like they are the same person except for the age difference. We think that they could be related, but we don't know how yet. Maybe a grandson. The chief was looking at the picture and pointed at Winslow. I remember him. I saw him in town once. My dad knew him. When Winslow first moved here, he joined the VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars, that used to be over on Harrison Street. My dad was a member, and I remember him telling me that Winslow had been a lieutenant in the army and served in Korea. That's all I remember about him. I plan to find out everything I can about Mr. Winslow. It'll help to know that he was in the service. Keep me in the loop. After I met with the chief, I sent a text to Van Horn and told him that Winslow had been a lieutenant in the army, and I asked him if he could get Winslow's military records from the Pentagon. Thursday, January 28, 2016. Hannity Van Horn and I were in the conference room waiting for Chief Paziak to join us. When he came into the room, the chief looked at the donut box on the table and said, I hope you saved at least one bear claw for me. Hanrity slid the box over to the chief and said, We saved you too. The chief sat at the head of the table and turned to me. Okay, Brian, bring me up to speed. It seems that no matter how we try to look at this, we end up back at the old Cobain place, I said. That's where this all started. There used to be stories that the Cobain place is haunted, and four of the missing women mentioning something about going to a haunted house may be just a coincidence, but that is all we have right now. Then there is the mention of the name Michael in two of the cases, and the only Michael we can connect to the Cobain place is Michael Bliss. Rich and I have been talking to people all over Brodericksburg, and no one seems to know anything about Michael Bliss. He is seldom seen in town and rarely during the day. We have established that Mr. Bliss is not from here, but we have no idea where he came from but we are still working on that. 
I have been back out to the farm to talk to Mr. Bliss, but I haven't seen him since that first time when Rich and I spoke with him. We did a DMV search on Bliss and found three different driver licenses for a Michael Bliss in Pennsylvania, but none of them matched our guy. As far as Jackson Winslow is concerned, we still haven't been able to establish if Mr. Winslow is still alive or not. No one has seen him in Broderick'sburg in many years. Most of the people that would have known Winslow have either moved away or passed away. The few people we found that knew him said that they hadn't seen him since around 1964. They thought that he had moved away. The DMV has no record of a driver's license in his name in Pennsylvania. Winslow has a P.O. box at the post office, but nobody at the post office has noticed who comes in to pick up the mail. The utility bills and the old Cobain Place's property taxes are current and paid on time. We would love to give the Cobain Place a full search using scientific equipment, but we don't have enough evidence to prove probable cause to get a warrant. I looked over at Van Horn and said, did you have any luck getting Winslow's military records? When I requested Lieutenant Winslow's records, I was told that they were classified and could not be released. I got one of our attorneys to request the documents using the Freedom of Information Act. We argued that Winslow left the Army in 1953, so his records should no longer be classified. It took us four weeks to work through the system, but we got the documents. We had an agent go to the Pentagon and pick them up. Jackson Winslow is from Los Angeles, California. He attended college at UCLA, and after graduating in 1950, he joined the Army with the Officer Candidate School option. In September of 1952, Lieutenant Winslow went to Korea. This is where things get strange. In May of 1953, Winslow was wounded and sent to a military hospital in Japan. From there, he was sent back to Letterman Army Medical Center in San Francisco. Shortly after he arrived at Letterman, Winslow was moved to the hospital at Camp Desert Rock, Nevada. Someone at the Pentagon had stuck a note Winslow's medical records that asked how Lieutenant Winslow ended up at Camp Desert Rock. It seems that the doctors at Letterman believed that Lieutenant Winslow's injuries were terminal and would not live more than a few days, so there was no reason to move him. There was nothing that they could have done for him at Camp Desert Rock that would change the outcome, but less than two months later, Jackson Winslow shows up in Broderick'sburg looking to all to be healthy as a horse. That is strange, Chief Paziak said. What would have been going on Camp Desert Rock in 1953 that would have benefited Winslow? Didn't make sense to me either, Van Horn said. Camp Desert Rock is near the atomic test site at Yucca Flat, Van Horn said. They tested an A-bomb just before Winslow arrived there. I don't see how that could have helped him. I got a strange vibe from this whole thing. So I had a friend at the Pentagon search for officers that graduated from OCS in 1950 or 1951. His search not only found Jackson Winslow, but he also found Winslow's OCS graduation photo. Gentlemen, I believe we have a problem, Van Horn said as he handed me the photo. The only words that came to me when I saw the photo of the newly minted lieutenant were, oh shit. As I passed the photo on to Hanrity and then to the chief, I said, that is not the Jackson Winslow in the wedding photo we have. What the hell does this mean? I know that was a long time ago. But is there any chance we could get a roster of the men at Camp Desert Rock in 1953? I asked Van Horn. Already working on that. Monday, March 7, 2016. We had no new leads in or missing person cases since our last meeting. Van Horn arrived for the meeting with a large file box. The box weighed at least 15 pounds and was full of loose papers that didn't appear to be in any order. I asked Van Horn, what's all this and what are we supposed to do with it? The records guy at the Pentagon wasn't happy with our request for a roster of the men at Camp Desert Rock in 1953. It seems that he threw anything that he could find that had to do with Camp Desert Rock in the box. I pulled all of the papers out of the box and divided them into three piles on the conference table. I suggested that we each take a pile, sort through it, and put the papers in your pile into chronological order, and to set aside anything that does not have a date on it. When we had three piles in order, we pulled out anything dated between April and June of 1953. After two hours of sifting through the papers, we got to the documents from May of 1953. In that pile, I found a note referring to Lieutenant Winslow's admission to the Camp Desert Rock Post Hospital on May 10, 1953. There was no mention of the lieutenant's condition. Then I found an accident report dated May 12, 1953. Listen to this, I said. Then I read the report to Van Horn and Hanrity. 
On the morning of May 12, 1953, a truck carrying four soldiers went off the road and down an embankment and caught fire. The four occupants perished in the fire. The names of the soldiers involved are Sergeant Michael Bliss, PFC William Locke, Douglas Talley, and Andrew Steinhauer. I look at Hanrady and Van Horn to get their reaction to the story. Hanrady's head snapped up, and he looked at me and then at Van Horn. What do you think? I asked them, do you think Sergeant Michael Bliss is possibly related to our Michael Bliss? Hanrady said, I don't know what to think about this, I said. Probably just a coincidence. But then again, I think that we will need to get Sergeant Bliss records. I went back to the stack of papers and continued to search through them until I found a document from May 28, 1953. This document was a report on the medical discharge of Lieutenant Jackson Winslow. The report stated that because of his injuries, the lieutenant was no longer fit for military service. The report went on to say that Winslow was being transferred to the VA hospital in Philadelphia. Major Robert Baker M. D. signed the document. I read the report out loud then said, something stinks about this. It looks to me like the Lieutenant Winslow wounded in Korea is not the same Lieutenant Winslow that was medically discharged and showed up in Brodericksburg in June of 1953. Van Horn pulled his cell phone out and made a call to the agent assigned to work with the Army's Criminal Investigation Service stationed at the Pentagon. Sorry to bother you again, Harvey, but I need another favor. We need to get the military records for Sergeant Michael Bliss who died in an accident at Camp Desert Rock on May 12, 1953. Van Horn laughed as he listened to the response he got from the agent on the phone. When he finished the call, Van Horn said, Harvey said he'll get with records and see what he can do. He said that he was sure they would help us because they enjoy digging through records that are over 60 years old. We didn't find anything else in the May or June papers, so we turned our attention to the pile of documents that had no dates on them. Halfway through that stack, Hanrady stuck his hand up to get our attention. Listen to this, he said. It's a letter from a Captain Donald Peterson, M.D. Letterman Army Medical Center, San Francisco, California, to Major Robert Baker, M.D. Major Baker, this letter is to confirm your request that we transfer Lieutenant Jackson Winslow from Letterman to the post hospital at Camp Desert Rock on the 10th. Preparations are underway for the transfer, but I am concerned that the lieutenant may not survive the trip, and I wonder if this transfer is necessary. So, this Major Baker requested that Winslow be transferred to Camp Desert Rock and then wrote up the medical discharge, but it appears that the Lieutenant Winslow that shows up in Brodericksburg is not the same man, I said. Van Horn was already on his cell calling Agent Harvey Lewis to ask him to request information on Major Robert Baker. I signaled Van Horn that I want to say something to him. Van Horn said, Harvey to hold on a sec. Ask him to request the full report on the accident that killed Sergeant Michael Bliss also. Twenty minutes later, Van Horn got a phone call from Agent Lewis. He said, what? Tell him I want to talk to the officer in charge. Another five minutes had passed when Van Horn's phone rang again. Van Horn lessened for a moment then said, Captain Hollis, this information is vital to our investigation. Yes, I know these files are old, but the case we are working on is urgent and lives depend on our getting this information ASAP. Thanks, I appreciate that. Chief Paziak came into the room while Van Horn was on the phone and listened to the call. When Van Horn put his cell phone on the table, he looked at me and smiled. Urgent and lives depend on it? The chief said, Well, Halloween does fall on a Saturday again in 2020, Van Horn said. Anyway, Captain Hollis said he would have his guys get us what we want. The chief looked at his watch and said, It's almost noon. Why don't you order lunch in and bring me up to date on what you've learned today? Pizza okay with everyone? The others agreed. So I ordered five pizzas and put the charge on my credit card. You ordered five pizzas for the four of us? Van Horn said. When the guys in the squad room smell those pizzas, they are all going to looking for a slice. I got two for us, and three will be for the squad room, I said. Put that on your expense sheet as working lunch, the chief said. I smiled and said, I was going to. You guys do have the best meetings, Van Horn said. At 2 p.m., Van Horn got an email with two attachments from Captain Hollis. Van Horn forwarded the note to me to upload the attachments to my computer and display them on the large screen on the conference room wall. I opened the first file, and it was a PDF file of Sergeant Bliss' fatal accident report. 
Four men fatally injured in a crash on Post Road No. 2 at 1400 hours on May 12, 1953. The four men killed were Sergeant Michael Bliss, PCF Douglas Talley, PFC William Locke, and Private Andrew Steinhauer. The two-and-a-half-ton truck driven by PFC Talley was carrying a 50-gallon drum of diesel fuel and was on its way to the motor pool within the Yucca Flat test site when the left front tire blew out, causing the driver to lose control. The truck went off the side of the road, down an embankment, and into a dry wash. The truck rolled over and came to rest upside down in the wash. Diesel leaking from the drum caught fire and consumed the truck and it, passengers. The four men were pronounced dead at the scene by Dr. Robert Baker, MD U.S. Army. This Dr. Baker certainly gets around, Hanrady said. When I opened the second attachment, it contained a news release from the Army to the Cincinnati Post and the Cincinnati Enquirer reporting Sergeant Bliss' death. Sergeant Bliss was from the Cincinnati area. The announcement gave a vague description of the accident, which was unimportant to our investigation. What I found to be important and extremely disturbing was that file photo of Sergeant Bliss included in the news release. There was no mistaking that Sergeant Bliss and the Jackson Winslow that married Margot Kurtz in 1954 were either identical twins or were the same person. I looked at Van Horn and Hanrady and then looked at the chief, and I could tell that we were all thinking the same thing. Are we all thinking that it was Jackson Winslow that died in that truck accident and that Sergeant Bliss replaced him? The chief looked at me and smiled. This is another fine mess you have gotten us into, Brian. I agree, I said. What the hell is going on here? Anyone care to guess? The case you are working concerns 10 missing people over a 56-year period, right? Chief Paziak said. How is it that this investigation is now looking into what happened 62 years ago at Camp Desert Rock, Nevada? We are trying to investigate all of these missing person cases, but we can't escape the possibility that the disappearances of Margot Winslow and Jerry Adler were the catalyst for the rest of these cases, I said. If Detective Rose was right back in 1959 in his belief that Winslow killed his wife and her lover, then that is our starting point. I think at some point, we are going to have to solve the mystery of Jackson Winslow and Michael Bliss. I can't say that I disagree with you, but while we are pissing around trying to figure out what happened in 1953, the Tracy Johnson case is getting cold. We are rapidly getting to the point where we will have to put this on the back burner and get on with our current cases. I knew the chief was getting frustrated with our investigation's slow pace, but I was sure that he would not pull us off the case. When Van Horn had not yet received the information about Major Robert Baker, we decided to call it a day at 5 o'clock. I suggested that we get together again next week, and Van Horn said that in the meantime, he would forward anything he got regarding any of the players in our insane game of Clue to me. Thursday, March 10, 2016. It was just after 10 o'clock Thursday morning, and Hanrady and I were sitting in my office talking about what we need to accomplish the rest of the day when Agent Van Horn walked in with a box of donuts. I know we weren't planning to meet again till next week, but I have some information that won't wait. You might want to have Chief Paziak join us, Van Horn said. I called the chief and told him to meet us in the conference room, and then we headed over there. When the chief came in, he looked at the donut box, smiled, pulled out a bear claw, and sat at the head of the table. I didn't think we were meeting until next week, the chief said as he took a big bite out of his bear claw. Pal has something for us that he didn't think could wait till next week, I said. I'll start with the information on Major Baker I got late yesterday, Van Horn said. Major Robert Lane Baker graduated from Penn State Medical School in 1934 and joined the Army that same year. His first assignment was at Walston Army Hospital at Fort Dix, New Jersey. In 1941, he transferred to Letterman Army Medical Center in San Francisco, where he served until 1952. That year, the Pentagon made Major Baker the lead medical officer in charge of the atomic weapons test site at Yucca Flat. In June of 1953, Major Baker returned to Fort Dix, where he was head of radiology at Walston. Baker retired as a lieutenant colonel in 1977 and went to work for RURP, a medical lab in Philadelphia. In 1987, a gas explosion at Reorp killed Baker and two other doctors who worked with him. Lead medical officer in charge of atomic weapons test site? That's new, but I don't see what that means to us. You must have something more to get you to buy donuts and drive up here, Hanrady said. You're right, and there is more, Van Horn said. 
What I forgot to mention was that the lab explosion was on October 29, 1987. When I saw that, I checked FBI records to see if we had been involved in the explosions investigation, and it turns out we were. The Philadelphia Fire Marshal ruled the explosion an accident. Still, he was angry to find out that what was supposed to be a medical lab was actually a chemical lab, and they were working with dangerous chemicals. They would never have been permitted to build the lab where they did if the zoning board knew the true nature of the work to be done there. The fire marshal couldn't find out who owned the building, so he asked the FBI to come in. Well, you know how we work. We were not going to take the fire marshal's judgment that the explosion was an accident. The investigators had concerns about the fire marshal's ruling. The first problem was the size of the explosion. For that much gas to leak undetected before the explosion, the gas had to have filled the lab very quickly. Our team thought it more likely that someone opened several of the gas valves in the lab. While the agents worked their way through the wreckage, they found a small fireproof file cabinet. The cabinet was transported to the FBI forensic lab. Here is where the story gets interesting to us again. Inside the file cabinet, the investigators found a wealth of information about the lab. First off, REORP, which stands for Reduce Effects of Radiation Poisoning, did not build the lab. The building was initially intended to be a connivance store, but the owner went bankrupt before Reorp moved in. Reorp just bought the empty building and moved in. That is how they escaped scrutiny from the zoning board. Next, there were three men responsible for creating the lab in September of 1953. Dr. Robert Baker, whom we already know, and Dr. Jonas Bradshaw, a biochemist, and Dr. Werner Schmidt. Schmidt was a former Nazi scientist. Some of the papers referred to chemical compounds with code names like K-17, H-42, and N-68. Now, here is the most concerning find. There was a logbook that showed appointments for someone only referred to as the sergeant. The appointments occurred once every six months, with the first appointment on October 30, 1953, and then every April and October after. The last appointment for the sergeant was on October 29, 1987 the day the lab blew up. Our investigators believe that the person referred to as the sergeant opened the gas valves on several of the lab's Bunsen burners and that he was responsible for the explosion. Unfortunately, they were never able to identify the sergeant. I wish we could turn in our shovels, because this hole is already too deep, Chief Paziak said. There's more. The agents found a notebook that was not in the file cabinet. There was some burn damage to the notebook, but what was still legible was quite interesting. The notebook contained comments about the sergeant's condition. The notes for October 29, 1987, said that his test results are all still normal. Here is the comment that gave me goosebumps. The sergeant still shows no indication that he has aged since the accident in 1953. Somehow I didn't think that referred to the truck accident at Camp Desert Rock. All last night I was trying to think of what other possibilities there could be. On a hunch this morning, I contacted Captain Hollis and asked for information on the three soldiers who died in the truck accident with Sergeant Bliss. Hollis got back to me while I was driving up here. What would be the odds that you would randomly pick four men to deliver a drum of diesel fuel, and they would all happen to be single and have no living relatives? And then they all happen to die in an accident in the desert with no witnesses, and our Major Baker at the scene of the accident to pronounce the four men dead? Who do you think the sergeant is? The chief said. I hate to say it, but I believe we are all thinking it, I said. Winslow told Detective Rose that he was in Philadelphia when his wife disappeared. Could he have been there for his six-month checkup? Baker was a major when this all started, and I guess that he refused to refer to their patient as Lieutenant Winslow, but he didn't want Michael Bliss' name anywhere in his notes, so he referred to him as the sergeant. Brian, give me your best guess at what we are looking at, the chief said. I closed my eyes for a minute to gather my thoughts. Okay, I think this all started back at Camp Desert Rock, where I believe Major Baker was involved in something that went terribly wrong. I think that Sergeant Bliss and the three other men that supposedly died in the truck accident had also been involved in Major Baker's screw-up, and he had to find a way to clean it up. I'm guessing that Locke, Tally, and Steinhauer died due to Major Baker's actions, but Sergeant Bliss survived. Whatever Major Baker was involved in, he needed to keep Sergeant Bliss from talking to anyone about it. Major Baker found out about a dying Lieutenant Winslow, who happened to have a similar build to the Sergeant Bliss and had him transferred to Camp Desert Rock. 
Then he staged the truck accident, put Lieutenant Winslow's body in the truck with Locke, Tally, and Steinhauer, instead of Sergeant Bliss. The Major sent Sergeant Bliss to Philadelphia to become Jackson Winslow, and the appointments every six months were set to monitor the sergeant's health changes, but according to their notes, there were no changes in his health from 1953 until 1987. The notes the FBI found during their investigation seem to suggest that whatever happened to Sergeant Bliss has stopped him from aging. That's hard to believe, but it does explain why no one has seen Jackson Winslow. He has to hide because people would notice if he didn't age over the last 62 years. So, Michael Bliss comes back looking like he did when he was 25. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the only way I can put things together in a way that makes any sense to me. As to the missing women, I'm guessing that Winslow came home from his checkup at Reorp on October 31, 1959, found his wife with Jerry Adler, and in a fit of rage, killed both of them. If Detective Rose had been able to find the bodies back then, I don't think we would be here talking about any of this right now. Kyle, do you agree with Brian's take on this? Chief Paziak said, I don't like it, but I don't see any other explanation that fits the information we have. I say information instead of facts, because we can't prove any of this. To get to the bottom of this, we will need to talk to Michael Bliss and search the old Cobain place. I guess it's time to get the district attorney involved in this. The chief said, He's gonna love this, Hannity said. And what judge is going to give us a search warrant based on what we have? The chief stood up and said, Brian, I want you to write up your analysis of what happened the night of October 31, 1959, at the old Cobain place using the information in Detective Rose's report from that time and adding in your thoughts on the case. Yes, sir, but I don't understand the purpose of doing that, I said. How do you eat an elephant? The chief said. One bite at a time, I replied. I will take this to the DA as a cold case we are trying to close and try to get you a search warrant for the entire Cobain farm. If you find anything incriminating to either Winslow or Bliss, we'll go from there. That would be great, I said. Kyle, do you think you could get us a ground-penetrating radar unit to use if we get a chance to search the farm? When you get a search warrant, send a request for a GPR to me, and we will make it happen, Van Horn said. It took a month, but on Tuesday the 14th of April, Chief Paziak finally convinced the DA and a judge to give us the old Cobain Place search warrant. I sent a note off the Van Horn requesting their assistance in our search, mainly to provide us with a GPR unit and a trained operator to use it. I could have asked the state police, but I knew that Van Horn wanted to be involved in the search. We planned to serve the warrant Wednesday morning. With the upcoming search of the Cobain property still on my mind when I walked into the house that evening, I walked past Carrie without giving her my usual kiss. When I got upstairs to our bedroom, Carrie was right behind me. Did I do something wrong? Carrie said. What? No. Why would you ask me that? I said. You walked past me without saying hello or giving me a kiss. I turned to her, grabbed her around the waist, and bent her over backward and said, I am sorry. Then I kissed her. When I let her up, Carrie was smiling and said, Wow. I forgive you. Now, have you got any more of those for me? I kissed her again and said, You'll have to wait till after dinner to get the rest. You looked lost when you came into the house. You have a bad day? Carrie said, Why don't you fix us a drink while I change, and I'll come down and tell you all about it. In the past, I would never talk to Carrie about a case I was working. It may have been the right thing to do, but it almost cost us our marriage once. After that, I keep her informed of what I am doing if there is any chance that what I am doing can affect us. I know I can trust her to keep what I tell her in confidence, and I never want to come close to losing her again. I spent nearly an hour telling Carrie the story about the missing person cases and what I believe to be a connection to the old Cobain place. Then I told her the Michael Bliss, Jackson Winslow story. Carrie never said a word while she listened to me. When I finished, she said, Are you serious? That sounds like the script for a Halloween horror movie. Unfortunately, what I told you is the most likely answer to what we are looking at, I said. I could tell by the look on her face that Carrier did not doubt me. She was just having a hard time accepting the possibility that the things I told her could happen. I was getting the feeling that something was stressing you out over the last several weeks, Carrie said. Why didn't you ask me about it before? Carrie put her hands behind my head and pulled me to her and said, I didn't want to add to your stress, 
and I knew that you would eventually tell me what was going on. Then she kissed me, and as she was pulling away, she reached down with her right hand and gave me a little squeeze that gave me a big reaction. When we get to bed, I will give you all the stress relief you need, she said. Now I have to get out dinner on the table. I still had a lump in my pants when I sat down at the table, and Carrie noticed it with a smile. Wednesday, April 15, 2016. Wednesday morning, Hanrity and I went to the Cobain place with a team of seven Broderick'sburg police officers. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. So I taped a copy of the warrant to the door and waited for Van Horn to arrive. Five minutes later, two FBI trucks came up the long driveway. One of the trucks was pulling a trailer with a small boat on it. When Van Horn got out of the truck, I asked him about the boat. The boat has side-scan radar that will allow us to see if there is anything on the bottom of the pond that shouldn't be there, Van Horn said. Have you served the warrant yet? Nobody home. So I taped the warrant to the door. We are good to go. Van Horn spoke briefly with a couple of his agents, and they backed the boat trailer down to the pond, launched the boat, and got busy scanning the bottom of the pond. When I saw the GPR rolling off the truck, I wondered how the operator was going to roll that thing over 20-plus acres of farmland, covering a path only a few feet wide on each pass. The operator introduced himself as Larry Nelson and said the lawn between the barn and the house looked like a good place to start because the ground was flat. He said, I'll make a test run here to make sure the equipment is working correctly. He walked in a straight line parallel to the side of the barn. He went about 50 feet, turned around, and came back along a line about four feet to the right of his first pass. When he got back to where I was standing with Van Horn, Larry said, there's an anomaly under the ground here. Van Horn and I both moved over to look at the GPRs, screen but nothing I saw there made any sense to me. It was just a bunch of lines at different angles. Let me try that pass again and see what we get, Larry said. He started in the same place he made the first pass, moved what I would estimate at six feet in from the driveway, and stuck a wire with a red flag on it into the ground. He moved another two feet stuck in another flag. Larry moved forward another six or so feet and put down another flag. Before Larry got to the other side of the lawn, he had placed five flags. Larry then moved about five feet to his left and started back toward us, placing flags along the way. When he got to us, Larry moved the GPR to our right and started across the lawn again. In all, Larry made 20 passes and about ran out of his little flags by the time he finished. What did you find? Van Horn asked Larry. There is something down there. Come take a look at this. Van Horn and I followed Larry over to the barn and stopped next to the first flag he put down. Look down the lines of the flags, Larry said. There were five rows of flags, all in straight lines. Before I got to this first marker, there was an area the GPR penetrated down about 4.5 meters. It's unusual to go that deep unless you are scanning through material like dry sand. This first flag marks an anomaly that is about 3.0 meters down and runs to the side of the house. The second flag indicated something solid that is only 1.2 meters down. As I move to the middle flag, the surface of whatever is under us rises to 0.76 meters, then drops back to 1.2 meters at the next flag. The last flag marks an anomaly at 3.0 meters and then I get another reading down to 4.5 meters. As you can see by looking at the flags, whatever lies below the ground here seems to run from the barn to the house. What do you think it is? I asked. The impression I get is like the arched top of an underground tunnel. I've seen this kind of thing before. I looked at Van Horn and said, a tunnel? That's not all. I would guess that both sides of the tunnel have been filled with sand with enough extra sand to cover the top. Why sand? It's not like the soil around here is sandy, I said. I'm guessing to keep the tunnel dry. Rainwater and snowmelt would rapidly drain through the sand. The anomaly I found at three meters down on bother sides of the structure, I think could be French drains to remove water as it sinks through the sand. If Quentin Cobain built a tunnel here in the 1850s, where would he get all that sand and the materials to build a tunnel? I said, don't know about the stones for the tunnel, they could be local but the sand probably would most likely have been brought up the river on barges. I guess we will have to find a way into the tunnel. Rich, you go with Kyle and see if you can find an entrance from the barn, and I'll take our new friend, Larry, and we'll go into the cellar and see if we can find it. I said, before we go, I need to get something from the truck, Larry said. When Larry returned, 
He was carrying a little red box with four wheels and a handle that looked like a gamer's control stick. What's that? I asked. It's a handheld GPR. It could help us find the door to the tunnel, Larry said. I got two flashlights from my car and handed one to Larry, and we headed down into the cellar. Even with the cellar lights on, it was hard to see anything. We managed to find the cellar wall area where an entry to the tunnel would most likely be. I was examining the wall, looking for any sign of a door or gateway, but I could not see any. I stopped for a second and saw Larry holding his handheld GPR, and he was rolling it along the wall the way a little boy would roll a toy car on the wall. Larry stopped just to my left and said, The tunnel starts here. Then he continued another ten feet or so and stopped and said, This is where it stops. If there is a way in, it has to be right here between us. I examined the wall again but still couldn't find a door. There might be some sort lever to release the door, Larry said. You're tall, so you look along the top of the wall, and I'll look along the bottom. When I didn't see anything, I started feeling around between the floor joists. I found it between the joists just above where Larry said the tunnel began. It felt like a metal handle. I pushed down on it, but it didn't move, so I pulled up, and when I did, I heard a clank, and a large section of the wall pivoted open with minimal sound. I looked into the darkness inside the tunnel and wondered what might be waiting for us in there. I tried to call Hanrity and Van Horn, but I wasn't getting a cell or a radio signal. So I asked Larry to go over to the barn and tell them we found the door. While Larry was gone, I stepped inside the tunnel and was surprised to see how big it was. My flashlight beam could not penetrate to the other end. My first thought was that this tunnel would be the perfect place to hide the bodies, but there was no smell that would indicate the presence of any. Tina Johnson disappeared six months ago, but I would have expected there would still be a lingering smell of decomposition if she was in there. I dragged my foot across the tunnel floor and could feel that it was composed of compacted dirt. That made me wonder if the bodies could be under the tunnel's floor. While I waited for Van Horn and Hanrity, I stepped another ten feet into the tunnel but had to stop when there was a bright flash of light, a loud bang, and the ricochet of a bullet hitting the way just to my left. I dropped to my knees and turned off my flashlight. Apparently, Michael Bliss was hiding in the tunnel. Michael Bliss, don't shoot. I'm Captain Hobbs of the Brodericksburg Police Department. You're trespassing. You have no right to be here, Michael said. I have a search warrant that gives me the legal right to search the property. It's taped to the kitchen door. Come on out, and I'll show it to you. You get out of here. Get off my property. Michael, this is not your property. It belongs to Jackson Winslow. I only said that to gauge his reaction. Ah, uh, that's what you think. Oh yeah, I forgot. You are Jackson Winslow and Michael Bliss, aren't you? I bet you have one hell of a story to tell, and I would love a chance to hear it, I said. Like I am going to trust you. You're just like everyone else. All you want to do is to put me in a cage like a lab rat. You can forget it. If you fight us, you will end up getting yourself killed. It would be a relief if you could, but you can't kill me. I am immortal. Just then, I could hear several voices coming into the cellar. I could see their flashlight beams as they approached the tunnel doorway. I yelled over my shoulder, Turn your flashlights off. Michael is in the tunnel, and he is armed. Are you okay? Hanrity yelled back to me. I am fine. He fired once and missed. What do you want to do? Stay where you are. I am coming out. When I got out, I asked Van Horn if they left anyone in the barn looking for an entrance. We left two agents over there. We couldn't find a door, but they are still looking. We need to get word to them that Michael Bliss is in the tunnel, and he is armed. He may be able to open a door on that end from inside the tunnel, so they need to be ready if he tries to slip out that way. You'll have to go outside to call them. There is no cell or radio reception down here. Van Horn rushed out of the cellar to make the call. Do you think he is hiding the bodies in there? Hanrity asked. I don't know, let me ask him, I said. With the cellar dark, I opened the tunnel door again and stepped back inside. I pulled out my recorder and turned it on before speaking to Michael. Michael, are you still here? Where else would I be? I can hear your friends banging on the wall in the barn, so I have no way out. Can I ask you a question? Guess I can't stop you, but I might not answer, Michael said. When you killed Margot and Adler, did you bury them down here? He was quiet for a minute, and I thought he wouldn't answer me, so I started to ask him again when he interrupted me. 
I never wanted to hurt her, but she cheated me. Is she buried in here? No, Margot is not buried in here. She is beside me right now. She has told me that she has forgiven me. Margot talks to you? Yes, she talks to me all the time. That is except for the times she runs away, and I have to go find her. How many times has Margot run away? Eight times. When she goes, it's always around Halloween. That was one of our favorite times together. She ran away eight times over the last 56 years? How old are you, Michael? I'll be 88 on October 11th. I bet you don't believe me. I believe you, Michael. What do I have to do to get you to put down your gun and come out of here with me? I can't leave Margot, and the Virginian told me that I couldn't trust you. Who's the Virginian? Just someone that was already here when I found this tunnel. And he talks to you? Yes. The Virginian always tells me when Margot has gone away and what I have to do about it. Michael, I am going to go back into the cellar for a while, but I'll come back so we can talk some more, I said. I would be happier if you just left me alone. Sorry, Michael, but I can't do that. I slipped back out of the tunnel and joined Hanrity, Van Horn, and Larry in the cellar. He hears voices, I said. He believes that his dead wife talks to him, and someone he calls the Virginian also speaks to him. Who the hell is the Virginian? Hanrity said. I have no idea. He said the Virginian was there when he found the tunnel. He says he won't come out of there because he has to stay with Margot. How are we going to get him out? Hanrity said. Any ideas? I said. We have riot gear in one of the trucks, Van Horn said. Riot gear? We have one guy in a tunnel, not exactly a riot. I said. What I was going to say is that included with the riot gear, we have gas masks, tear gas, and night vision goggles, Van Horn said. We toss in a tear gas canister, wait a minute, then go in and bring out. Sounds like a plan. Ten minutes later, we were ready to go in. Van Horn, Hanrity, and I slipped inside the tunnel and put on the gas masks and night vision goggles. On my signal, Van Horn threw a gas canister toward the far end of the tunnel. Within a minute, we could hear Michael coughing. The three of us moved as quickly and quietly through the tunnel as we could. I spotted Michael squatting down and trying to rinse the tear gas from his eye with a bottle of water. The three of us rushed him before he could do anything to defend himself. Hanrity and I pined Michael down while Van Horn cuffed him. As we got Michael on his feet, I told him that he was under arrest for the murder of Margot Winslow. Then I read him his rights. Once Michael was taken away to be booked, we went back into the tunnel to search for Margot's body and others we might find. The tear gas was still clouding the air, but we found the latch to open the door into the barn end of the tunnel. I called the station and asked Sergeant McKinstry to bring a couple of large fans out to the farm so we could clear the gas from the tunnel. McKinstry arrived about the same time the state's crime scene investigators arrived. It took 15 minutes to clear the air enough for the investigators to enter the tunnel. The crime scene team brought in powerful quartz lights on tripods to light the tunnel. Van Horn, Hanrity, and I followed the team as they proceeded through the tunnel. It was somewhere about in the middle of the tunnel when we made a gruesome find. There were 14 bodies in the tunnel. Nine of the bodies were naked women, one a naked man, and four men dressed in clothes that looked very old. Surprisingly, the bodies weren't just piles of bones. The bodies had become mummified. I looked at Alan Simpson, the lead on the CSI team, and he said, I have seen this happen before, but never around here. It takes the perfect combination of dry air, temperature, and absorption capacity of the underlying soil. It appears that we have that perfect combination in this tunnel. After that, Van Horn left to report what we found to his boss, and Hanrity went back to the station to tell the chief. I stayed with the crime scene boys. At 5 o'clock that evening, the state coroner picked up all nine bodies that were Michael Bliss' responsibility and sent them to the morgue for identification and autopsies. One of the crime scene guys found a letter in the pocket of one of the four remaining bodies. The letter was from Henry Wise, the governor of Virginia, requesting local law enforcement's assistance in searching for the runaway slaves. The letter was dated September 25, 1857. A forensic anthropologist was notified about the find, and arrangements were made for him to be there tomorrow morning. As the crime scene team packed up their gear and prepared to leave, I closed the barn's tunnel entrance. I was walking back toward the cellar entrance as I saw the last CSIs go. So I hurried to catch up to them. 
As I passed the four men still on the floor of the tunnel, I heard a voice clearly say, Tell Governor Wise what happened to us. I hurried to get out of the tunnel, pushed the door closed behind me, and tried to convince myself that I didn't hear anything. Over the next several months, the state coroner's office was able to identify all of the women as being those in the missing person cases we were working. They also identified the naked man as Jerry Alder. The forensic anthropologist determined that the four men in the tunnel were bounty hunters who made their living hunting down runaway slaves. The four men were all carrying sidearms, but all had been shot dead with the same pistol. Based on the clothes, the letter they carried, and the guns in their holsters, the four men died a short time after Governor Wise wrote that letter for them. Michael Bliss told the story of the failed experiment in April of 1953, which resulted in Locke, Talley, and Steinhauer's deaths. He confirmed that he became Jackson Winslow to hide his true identity. Michael was asked how he was able to survive without ever holding a real job. He told the interviewer that he was paid $3,000 a month until 1987 when he blew up the Reorp lab. What did you do then, Michael? By then, I was getting Jackson Winslow's social security check every month, and I had made some investment back when this started that helped me later. What kind of investments? IBM, Xerox, AT&T, and Standard Oil. Those stocks did very well for me. Michael was never tried for the murders he committed. In a strange twist of fate, it seems that when we tear-gassed him in the tunnel, the gas reacted with something in his body, and he began to age rapidly. His outward appearance didn't change much. It was his liver, lungs, heart, kidneys, and other organs that started to shut down. He lived for two months after his arrest. His cause of death was listed as heart failure, but it could have been any of his organs that did him in. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.